Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to SaveWithConrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer himself, the many, many time assistant manager, the multiple time world champion. He is Double J, Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? For life, too sweet, four horsemen. Let's rock today, Conrad. I'm fired up. You know, here's yeah, the thing, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. What a great weekend I had. You know who I hung out with this weekend? Don't you do this. You better Holy not. Right. Kelly Blanchard, a, a former, we're you know, it's like a fraternity. It's uh, you know, we 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 uh, brothers stick together, a band of brothers, uh, professionally known as the Four Horsemen. Uh, Rick, I mean, he came over and I grilled steaks for him the other night, and uh, me and JJ had probably about an hour conversation and. And then Lex, uh, we were just chatting as well. And, and Paul Roma, we've missed each other's texts. And I mean, it just goes on and on, Conrad. It just goes on and on. You know, folks think <laughs> this is just something you and I do for the show. But off air, you sent me a picture of you and Tully Blanchard holding up four fingers. And he said, here's proof. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. And then eventually you got around to posting it. But you took that picture just to stick it to me. And I don't appreciate that. Just see. So well, I, I have witnesses Conrad that I said, um, we, we were at the big event. Great. Can, uh, it was, you know, I've, I did that a couple of years ago, but me and Karen went up and got to be by my old pal road dog and heard all kinds of impersonations. You know, he's a funny feller, but uh, yeah. no, we had a good time. Um, saw a lot of friends, got to see the Steiner brothers, uh, Robbie's raising hell. He came over a couple of times to road dogs table and just did a complete, he took every picture on the table and made it one big pile and then walked off and laughed. So our vendor was really happy with that. Shout out to Lewis, but no, um, as I was, uh, in between, uh, a quick little bathroom break, I walked past, uh, Tully and Hey, Tully, good to see you. Hey man. Uh, then another guy. And then, and then one of the vendors said, Hey, can we get a picture of y'all together? And I said, sure. So Conrad. Uh, you know, I respect Tully and everything. We're both second generation. I'm third generation, but you know, we're, it's a family industry. And so I stood beside him and threw the peace sign up the double J two fingers up and we took a photo and that's the first one. And I got proof of that. I didn't send you that picture. And then I started to walk away and he said, Hey Jeff, what about this? And he held up the four and I said, Tully, don't do that. That I read Conrad, please don't do that. He said, no, I want you to do it. I said, Tully, this is just going to aggravate my podcast partner. And I don't like to aggravate him. I just, That's not true. you love it. You live for it. I, right, I don't. And, and, and he said, come on, just throw it up, Jeff, because I did some research and I was listening to the podcast and he says your deduction that you were actually the leader of the four horsemen in 97 makes complete sense. And, you know, he did Rick. not listen to the show. He did not <laughs> say that. Billy Blanchard probably don't even know how to get a podcast on his phone. That's not true. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. 
I ain't got time for all that. You're a fool, so don't be a fool on April first. I'm counting down the days, man. Got Supershowlive.com. Got a big announcement. I don't know if by the time you've heard this or not, if it's out or not, but uh, it's a coming. Mm -hmm. uh, Supershowlive.com. It's going to be the place to be. I'm pretty fired up about it. I think it's going to be a good time. I hope you'll be there in Dallas with us at Gillies. We know for sure we got Jeff Hardy. We know for sure we got Jeff Jarrett. We know for sure we got Eric Bischoff. And there's rumor and innuendo that mm, there's a fourth guy, not just a third man, but a fourth guy. And as you know, Jeff, everybody is going to be in Dallas. You want to be there as well. Now, if you can't be there, you could still go ahead and order the fight pay per view. That's right. It's over at supershowlive.com. You can watch live or on demand anytime you want. We've got some surprises up our sleeve. You don't want to miss. But if you pre order this week or next week, you get a Jeff Hardy trading card. And think about this, guys. Jeff Hardy's only had trading cards, as far as I know, in TNA and WWE. This will be the first time that you have a card of his not through one of those promotions. And Jeff, you remember way back when there was a little promotion that ran some cards for Memphis wrestlers. And boy, have those gone up in value in the last 10 years or what? I, so at the big event, two guys were in the line. They were together. They've already bought the pay-per-view specifically because of the card, their collectibles. But I could uh, play a little guessing game in there, but we're going to get to this topic, which I can't wait to dive into. But Conrad, I'll tell you a quick story. So at the event on Saturday, uh, the Undertaker was there. Uh, I mean, there was really a, uh, there was a, a great lineup, but there was this massively long line Conrad. And I'm like, wait, this line's kind of starting late, you know, because it opened at 10 went to four, but it was like, maybe even like one ish. And I'm like, that's a, that's that line is starting late. Cause the line wasn't moving. And, uh, these guys coming through, I, lots of my world listeners, Conrad, but they said, uh, no, we we're here. And this guy had this stack guess who was there on Saturday. And this definitely relates to trading cards, Reggie Jackson, Mr. October. And I'm telling you, Conrad, the guy laid into it. And I said, you know, my buddy Conrad, he's my buddy. I don't know if I'm his buddy, but he's into watches. And so we, we, we had a conversation about different folks collect different things. And I referenced you watch click Well, this guy's grandfather started him on collecting baseball cards. And he just said the value of cards has astronomically gone up. And he says, I'm telling you, the wrestling card world, he said, it's got a market, but obviously it's not a, like a baseball, but he said, it's coming and you, you better latch on. So they, they, uh, they had pre-ordered the fight to do that. Jeff, I, uh, first of all, I had a cool Reggie Jackson experience years ago. He's a watch guy. And at the time he, comp he complimented my, I was wearing a Rolex that day and he said, Oh, look at you with the heavy hitter. And I did a double take and I'm like, that's Reggie Jackson calling my watch a heavy hitter. And I looked down and he had what at the time was a sleeper. It was a white gold submariner, uh, with a blue dial and blue bezel. It wasn't necessarily something that was in high regard at the time. It's probably worth triple what it was back then. Wow. But he was being real. Mine was yellow gold. His was white gold. So from afar, you thought, well, it's stainless. It's not. So we had a great conversation with Reggie about watches, me and my buddy, but, uh, trading cards, man, I'm all in on it. I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this year. I don't know that you've ever discovered it at the office or talking to Silva, but in 2020, I spent about 35 grand on wrestling cards in like a one week period where I realized, wait a minute, this is going nuts. So I've got tons of un uh, like old cases and boxes that are unopened and sealed and i, I got a little footnote yeah it's kind of crazy yeah i was in uh batavia right outside of buffalo last week i was in new york this week and years ago tristar put out these impact cards and had a, a ring worn stuff i remember karen asking me like hey what would the you know ross foreman shout out to ross he wanted this anyway so her dress uh, a Kurt, uh, ring worn outfit, uh, me ring worn outfit. And there's, there's, a, there's only X amount of cards, but back to back weeks, I signed them and I had not seen those in years. So the, the just the visibility of trading cards, I signed several on Saturday, more than several, a guy came up and, uh, he said, I got 38. I said, 38. He said, yeah. And they're all trading cards. Will you sign them? I'm like, talk to my vendor. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, trading cards are. They're out there, pal. They're definitely out there. I mean, as we're talking right now, 
Uh, I just quickly flipped over to eBay. There's a $29,000 macho man listing. There's a $29,000 rock listing. These are for single cards. There's a box of sealed 1985 WBF cards, 25 grand. Oh, I mean, there's an old Ric Flair here for 15 grand an old Flair for 13, five. The point is these, these were mass produced. And so, as you know, Jeff, the more rare it is, the less they print, the more rare it is. And the more valuable it will be this Jeff Hardy card promotion that's happening at supershowlive.com. It's worth a multiple of what the pay-per-view costs. I'm just saying. And by the way, if you get uh, our VIP backstage experience, not only do you get, you know, early entry and happy hour and all that jazz, you watch the show from the side stage. Then you get to come backstage after the show. Then Jeff will autograph your card. And I think, uh, we're actually working on getting some PSA DNA guys there. So you can go ahead and get it authenticated and yeah. you slab that thing, send it off. Now you've got a rare card. That's all of a sudden, even more rare. Uh, you're going to get more than your money's worth is what we're trying to say. Go to supershowlive.com, get in on all the excitement. And now we're going to be talking about something pretty exciting today. I'm going because... to ask you one question real quick. Yeah. Cause I, I, do you think people will buy this pay-per-view? Uh, no disrespect to Jarrett Bischoff and Hardy and Thompson and not watch it just buy it for the card. I mean, I think, I don't know what they're pricing it out, <laughs> but I think it's like 12 or 15 bucks and the, card, the card's going to be worth 10 X that in a few months. I'd speculate. That's crazy. All right. Sorry. To so, so like, why would you not like to that's me, crazy. you want to, and, but again, that, that's because we all know what's going to happen. I mean, listen, we all know what's going to happen. <laughs> And so You're not starting a promotion, no, we're de we are definitely not starting a promotion. But what I'm saying is when are we going to be able to see a Jeff Hardy card that doesn't have a major brand on it ever again? Will it ever happen again? It's happening right now at supershowlive.com and happening this time, 30 years ago. Gosh, almighty. A very young Jeff Jarrett was uh, earning his stripes in a big way. We're going back and we're discussing today what won both Pro Wrestling Illustrated's and the Wrestling Observer's Feud of the Year. Now, I have to admit, Jeff, this is a little off what I would call the beaten path. That's a phrase we use here in the South. <laughs> and this is something that I had never seen. I grew up as a little Hulkamaniac and I kept up with what was going on uh, in WCW. But in 1992, I was not a tape trader. I did not get Memphis TV. I was not scouring the magazines to keep up with all the promotions. So I missed this. This was, as you and I say in our real life, a blind spot, but I've gone back and I've seen, and just to give you context, because a lot of our listeners grew up in the attitude era. That's their peak fandom. The feud of the year in 97 was not Bret Hart and stone cold, Steve Austin. I would have thought it was, but it was actually macho man and diamond Dallas page. And it was because it got personal. It got violent. It felt real. And a lot of that was because Kimberly was in Playboy and we had the broken ribs and man, just what a performer Randy Savage was. And he helped elevate Diamond Dallas Page in a, in a huge way. And it won all the awards for Feud of the Year in 97. Well, five years prior to that, you're setting the woods on fire with Jerry Lawler at, on your side, taking on the Moon Dogs. And that's something that was off my radar. So what we did is we put together a, a collection of clips because unfortunately, and Jeff, this is probably a story for another time, but all of the ownership of, Hey, who owns these Memphis tapes? Boy, that's been discussed for decades. <laughs> no this boy. guy has a claim. That guy has a claim. This guy sold it and that guy sued for it. And da, 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 da. Here's what I know. We don't own it. <laughs> and, and, and so we do not own this. I want to say that in a loud, clear voice. We also know that WWE doesn't own it. This would be a great time for me to say, Hey man, go pull up it on Peacock. It ain't there. I'd love to be able to say, Hey man, go check it out on impact plus it ain't there, but we don't want you to miss what is some really, really great stuff. Now I'm not saying you're frustrated with your current wrestling fandom. However, if you're looking for something to watch today, and you don't really want to watch Raw this week. You don't really want to watch SmackDown this week. Maybe you're tired of Rampage or Dynamite, or maybe Impact ain't really your thing. Maybe you just want some old nostalgia. You want to remember the way things were. We've got a collection of these videos that we don't own that are all on YouTube. 
and we've put them together so you can just navigate through sort of chapter and verse. And again, you'll see who has posted the footage because it is not us. We do not own it. But what we've done is we've grouped them together, this series of YouTube videos, just so it makes for more episodic viewing. And we bought a domain. I'm looking at my phone to make sure I do it right. Myworldmoondogs.com. So if you're enjoying what we're doing and you hear the story we're about to lay out and you think, gosh, I wish I could watch that. Go to myworldmoondogs.com. But this is probably, and don't get me wrong, we've talked a lot about the stuff prior to 1992, all the carrying on in Dallas and all that. That's recently in our rearview mirror here on My World. But this has got to be creatively one of the biggest things you were able to sink your teeth into and get excited about. A, because you're working with Jerry Lawler. B, because you're working on top. B, B, C, because it's just good shit. But D, because it's super violent. And the combination of all that has to be super exciting for a very young Jeff Jarrett. Would that be fair to say? Man, that would be more than fair to say. I'm not even really sure where to start, Conrad, because my fandom, a big part of it, I think I've gone into a little bit of detail. I was sitting on my couch and watched the Andy Kaufman, Jerry Lawler deal. Loved it. You know, I was the biggest Jackie Fargo, Jerry Lawler fan in the world. Those were my guys. I, I just, that, that's, you know, the guys that love Stone Cold or Rock or Cena or whatever. Lawler, <clears throat> although he was my dad's business partner, he was my guy. And so was Fargo. But the original concession stand brawl in Tupelo, Mississippi, that my dad was the executive producer or the booker or creator, whatever you want to call it. And then they did another one with a guy by the name of Ricky Morton, who did all right for himself, and Eddie Gilbert, who is the son of my grandfather, Eddie Martin's tag partner. So Eddie and Ricky uh, against two Japanese wrestlers, Onita and Fuchi, they did the second one. And so the third one was, and we'll get into the third concession stand brawl. But, but Conrad, the thing that more than anything, when I went back and dug into the research, shout out to Derek, he worked his ass off on this episode for research and context and the thing is that look pro wrestling illustrated won the award okay i'll, I'll take that because it drew money relatively speaking if we're going to talk about percentage increase and increases in houses it did well but <clears throat> my old buddy dave Meltzer, but no his readers and this is an era conrad that you really have to like sink in that dynamite kid Tiger Mask, all the fantastic Japanese, I hate to use the term, but that's what the work rate and, uh, you know, all, all those kinds of matches that, you know, and we're, we're talking, to, I mean, I could go on and on and on about the observer readers and, 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 and what they like. And here is something that won feud of the year And Conrad. I've watched a lot of this. I don't think I hit the road. I'm, there was no high spots. There was no, it was just a, a, a lot of brawling and a lot of storytelling with just wild ultra violent. Sorry, GCW. Uh, but I mean, it was just a lot of violence. That was the story. We're going to get in there and the people bought into it, believed it because, and I hate to use the word real, but the action was super, super, super stiff. And, it, you just kind of, I, I don't know, say scratch my head, but I look back and go, okay, feud of the year in 92, look at what was going on in WWF and WCW and Japan and Mexico and everything else. Anyway, it's fascinating to take a walk down this history lane. And, and especially Larry Latham was in all of them. Moondog spot was in every concession stand brawl. So, uh, we'll talk a lot about him on this episode. He is, is, uh, uh, he knew his, it's a perfect example, knowing his character and his persona, and he didn't get outside the lane on it ever. I want to mention 92, just so everybody is familiar with the era we're talking about. Um, Ric Flair is going to win the Royal rumble and become world champion. Uh, he's going to have an incredible feud with the macho man about she was mine first. They're going to have a, a bloody WrestleMania world title match. The ultimate warrior is going to come back to save Hulk Hogan 
from Papa Shango and Sid. Uh, the Undertaker is going to become a good guy. We've got that incredible match uh, over at Wembley Stadium with Davy Boy Smith and and Bret Hart. Uh, Nails is going to hold up Vince McMahon. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of really crazy stuff. That's just in the WWF. That's not even talking about all the things that happened in WCW. Um, but some really big time stuff happening, uh, across professional wrestling here, including everything with the dangerous Alliance and sting and a lot of great stuff. I'm saying all that to say this thing in Memphis that the whole country couldn't see <laughs> was better than all of it. So I just want to add context to that. So let's jump into it. Um, Conrad, are we, are we going to play, uh, and I don't want to jump ahead. I'm, I'm following your lead. The original concession stand brawl because the, the Lawler and Dundee <laughs> against his first cousin, a guy named Wayne Ferris, who we all know as the honky tonk man and Larry Latham who became a moon dog spot, but the original concession stand brawl that didn't win for you to the year, but it, it it's kind of the precursor to all this that that was uh, the blonde bar blonde bombers versus Lawler and Dundee. It it set the stage, and I don't know if you want to. Yeah, we'll play a clip of that from that's from seventy nine, and we're gonna play we're, we're not gonna play the whole thing. It's probably gonna be uh, in our YouTube link that we just referenced. But I just want to set the stage, as you said. One of these fellas is at Sushi Onita, who's gonna go on to create FMW. FMW used to fill freaking stadiums without TV. Think about that. In that era, there is no TV for FMW, but they can fill stadiums, not arenas, stadiums. I just don't, I want to add context to that. Without these, what we're going to talk about, the ultra violence in Memphis, I don't know that FMW exists. I don't know that ECW exists. I don't know that GCW exists. Um, and it's happening here in Memphis. So, Let's also remi- remind everybody that the moon dogs date back to 1973. So you're about to feud, um, with, with a couple of legendary performers, of course, Rex and King, uh, started in October of 80, uh, with the WWF. And we know that Rex was actually uh, the first smash of demolition, but of course we know that very quickly became Barry Darso and, 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 and. That's no longer a thing. The moon dogs reform and return to Memphis in late 91 managed by Richard Lee. Uh, Jeff, tell us about Richard Lee. So Richard Lee, uh, man, this is boy. This is a fun, uh, stroll down memory lane. Richard Lee was a, uh, like a lot of folks in Nashville, he's a singer songwriter and, um, down in East Nashville, he, you know, he, he, Look, Larry Latham had been around the territory a long time. Spike, uh, his real name was Bill Smithson. Uh, God rest his soul. But but Richard was a buddy of those guys that um, didn't really manage in the the early '80s. But Richard could 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 um, he could strum a guitar and write music. He wrote the original theme song to the Moon Dogs that played on that video where they came up out of that swamp which was in the, my dad's backyard <laughs> It's where they shot the video. But Richard uh, is a singer songwriter that um, loved the industry and could talk his ass off. That's the thing. Moondog spot drew money his whole career and never had a promo. You know, it's just, it's a, I know it's a different era, but, but again, Richard Lee was their mouthpiece, their, their manager. And um, he, he, uh, didn't mind getting his ass whoop, uh, when, when needed, but, uh, good old Richard Lee, he was the moon dogs manager. We're going to track a few minutes of audio here. Uh, this is from uh, June 15th, 1979. This is really the origin of hardcore long before Sabu was flying through tables or people were hitting each other with light tubes. <laughs> this is it. It's the original Tupelo concession stand brawl. There's a link of this up as we mentioned, but I'm going to track the audio. It's a few minutes as a reminder, it's Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee, two of the biggest stars in the history of Memphis taking on Larry Latham. Who's going to be one of the moon dogs and Wayne Ferris, who most of us know as a different name, Mr. Honky Tonk man himself. 
so here we go. I'm about five minutes in to a nine minute and 15 second clip. Uh, and again, all of these clips are at myworldmoondogs.com. Uh, so if you'd like to see it, go to myworldmoondogs.com. But here we'll track just a little bit of the audio and let Lance Russell uh, put the lyrics to this music that you're making. Here we go. Those belts jerked away from Latham and Ferris. And Dundee comes around from the side. Yeah, I know it. Our time is running out right now. We're going to have to call it quits as our time is up on championship wrestling. It looks like that uh, they are outside the ring. This is Lance Russell from the Tupelo Sports Arena. Hey, Mike, can you get the camera? They got a hell of a fight going on down there. Can you get it down? Let me get the light stand off here. We'll go back and edit this. We'll edit it back in. Okay, can you get it rolling? What you're looking at is the wildest fight we've seen. Latham and Ferris and Dundee and Lawler in the concession stand, all four of them bleeding. Pounded each other. Lawler. Ooh. Fired a gallon jug. They're banging away. Watch out, Mike. Dundee with Latham and Lawler with Ferris. Oh, there's mustard all over us. I hope it didn't get in the camera. The referee trying to get him stopped. Dundee right on top of Latham, right below us. We are on the stairs leading down to the concession stand. What a brawl. I've never seen anything like it. Now they're trying to get somebody in to help stop this thing. This is just totally out of hand. Latham and Ferris, Waller and Dundee in the concession stand at the Tupelo Sports Arena all over the concession stand. A gallon bottle had been thrown, glass on the floor. Waller slams Ferris with a stool and again Waller rattles a pan around. Dundee on the far side being stomped on the concrete. Can you get it? With Latham. In 27 years of it, I've never seen a battle like this. And Lawler trying to be strangled by Ferris while Dundee with a mop wailing Latham. Promoter Jerry Jarrett, although he is not a promoter here, trying to get him to stop. He's got Dundee separated. Waller, Latham having been racked up by that mop handle, Dundee going after him. It's just a street brawl. Jerry Jarrett with referee Jerry Calhoun. Jarrett trying to get it all stopped. Dundee picks up a table. Everything broken up. They're falling all over. Mustard everywhere. Ferris laying in the middle of the floor. Dundee rushed out of there. Lawler. So there you go. What a clip. The origin, the birth of hardcore here in Memphis, 1979. I think at the time you're just of your 12th birthday. Does that sound about right? That's right. That's right. And I appreciate you uh, that. I, I don't know how our listeners will respond to that, but 
I just thought it was really cool because, and I know we'll talk about Lance coming up uh, in the foreseeable future, but I, I, I just remember, and Conrad, I bet I've watched that clip in the, the, before I broke into the business a hundred times, I, I, cause I was mesmerized as how Lance, you know, it's all, you know, and what we see today with WWE or AEW, the slick production, but by design, it, it was, was real. It felt real. We're not supposed to see this. Yes. Oh, this wasn't supposed to happen. Oh, can you get a camera down here? Oh, Jerry Jarrett. And if you notice, Lance says he's a promoter, but not a promoter here. The context that is Eddie Marlin was the promoter of Tupelo, Mississippi. So Jerry Jarrett, former wrestler, he's stepping in to try to control this chaotic scene. Just the the the, the vibe I just thought was really, really good in that the brawl happened. They didn't, and I get it. Look, I'm not knocking TCW or ECW or any of that. I, I get how the business has evolved. I'm not saying go back in time. But in 1979, when this stuff went down, the wrestling fan at home on Saturday morning is going, Oh my God. Yeah. Did you yeah. see what man? Now I know they do a lot of stuff on Monday nights. That's fake, but by God, Conrad, Larry, Deborah, that was real. <laughs> the, the confines of the wrestling ring is where all the action has normally happened. And now here it is happening where seemingly it has no business happening and, and, and we're not throwing punches that guys could say, Oh, he missed him. No, we're hitting each other over the head with things Yeah, and yeah. we're breaking glass bottles. And I remember when I first got into tape trading, it was uh, late 96 or early 97. This was one of the most requested things because people wanted to see and appreciate, Hey, before there was FMW, before there was ECW, this is what started all of that. Now I know this is a random question. Uh, but it's June. Were you at this show? No. Okay. No, no, no. I was probably, uh, hooping it up basketball somewhere. Uh, you talking about 79? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it was basketball summers. So as you're doing basketball summers, you're still watching the TV show. Oh yeah. Um, as an 11 year old, nearly 12 K Fabe is alive and well in 1979. So you were buying this hook, line and sinker. Were you not completely? completely yeah i mean t t uh, again i cried at ringside when the blonde bombers beat up my old man and tojo but, but really my dad danny davis the nightmare who ran ovw in in the origination and and for years and years and years it was uh sergeant danny davis uh with the blonde bombers and danny had this riding crop and they put me on the back row of ringside and look i'm not five years old i'm 11 or 12 and they beat my old man up with a riding crop tears came to my eyes. So yes, kayfabe was alive and well. So when people look at me or like, ah, oh, you've never been a fan. I just go, Oh, you just don't really know. <laughs> so uh, now after that, now, again, what we just listened to was from 79, as we talked about though, they're coming back to Memphis after, you know, doing their thing separately, collectively. Now they're back together here and they win the USWA world tag team titles at the end of November, 1991 from Robert Fuller and Mike Mitchell. Um, it's a handicap match because Mitchell's not able to appear and you Jeff Jarrett interfere and cost the Fullers the title by accident. Do you remember this? Yeah. Yeah. And so you'll know just uh, cause Conrad, uh, on, on this one, uh, you're going to get a lot of, uh, mulligans and do-overs and gimmies cause you didn't experience this. I've never so, seen it. I, I, this wasn't something cool about. I love this episode because Hell, I'm gonna lie to you, and you have to believe it. No, I'm I have to. Yeah, <laughs> no, but it was Larry and and Honky Tonk Man in the original. Now, twelve years later, it's Larry and Bill Smithson, Spike. So, so, so the original was the Blonde Bombers. Now, the Moon Dogs do the concession stand brawl, and it's Larry Latham and Bill Smithson, known as Spike. So they come back, and the ter you know, look, the whole territory. It, we'll, we'll say in eighty eight, eighty nine. You know, it was just. Hulkamania was running wild. We've, we've discussed it and documented it and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, my old man and, and Lawler was like, we got to do something. We, we need to, what can we spice things up? And here Larry was, Hey, I don't know where he'd come from. I don't know if it was Puerto Rico or Mexico, or he was back in the area. Um, and they decided let's bring them in and shove them. And they did. And, uh, uh, 
Miller, Mitchell, whatever it was. I mean, he was like a one week wonder or whatever it was. He was in and out. I think there was issues, family situation anyway. So Robert went out and, and we knew we were going to, all right, we're going to kick off the angle. Uh, and later we're going to get into talking about moon dog itis, but I'll just say this. Colonel Parker was not a fan of moon dog matches. I, right. I'll just, I'll just say that he, he, uh, Robert liked to walk and talk. Uh, you can imagine that, but he, he knew business and, and we did, we shot the angle where I couldn't interfere because it was a handicap match. And, but anyway, we, we had to kickstart this thing and get the belts on the moon dogs. And I was at ringside. So I ended up taking an ass whipping, but that's how the whole program started with me and Robert, my longtime tag team partner. And, you know, Robert worked with me and taught me so much as an opponent, as a baby face, he is a heel. He taught me so much about promo and he really worked with me as a young guy um, when we were working against each other. And now it, the, the good story was, you know, Robert, the big tall Tennessean turns baby face and it's Jeff and Robert. We made a lot of picture money together and we rode up down the, yeah, that's where we really bonded as friends is when we did all that riding town, but here's the story. And, and uh, you know, it, we had to get the belts off Robert and uh, we got them on the moon dogs and we were off to the races with the 1992 feud of the year. <laughs> So here we go. Um, what had your dealings been like with the moon dogs prior to this? I mean, obviously you're about to be knee deep in an angle with them, but uh, you know, now you're, you're in the business. You're no longer that 11 year old kid. Did you have any interaction with them prior to this, whether it's in front of the camera behind the scenes or what have you? So Larry spot. I had, I think, man, there's going to be, I probably need to, we need to call up Mark James or, 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 uh, a Memphis historian. I may be way off base, but there was a title called the mid America title. It was the, uh, assistant general manager of <laughs> belt of the territory. I think my first feud and the first singles championship I won in the you know, regional territory was me and spot, but we spot, we worked a couple of programs, but he was one of the first guys because I had worked against, um, uh, Akio Sato and Goto and tag matches with Paul diamond and Pat Tanaka and have fat, you know, really fast paced and all kinds of stuff. I'd worked with Manny Fernandez and Hector Guerrero, but anyway, spot was one of the first opponents I had that was, um, character driven, not high spot driven that those were the kind of matches and Larry, look, he, he would take a t boatload of punishment. He would give a boatload of punishment, but his psychology was really good. He, he carried a bone to the ring the you know, a big old, uh, cow bone, but he protected that because that was his gimmick. That was his ace in the hole. If he hit you with the bone, you want, it, it was his finish. He didn't have any kind of F five or whatever it may be. So yeah, I had had some interaction with Larry in, in those short matches in the late eighties, uh, but it had been a while. And then when he came back and Bill Smithson, who's a Nashville guy, um, they came in and, and I knew what they were doing was different because there wasn't a bunch of choreographed high spots page out of Jim Cornette's book. There, you know, wasn't a bunch of just spot, 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 spot. It was a lot of brawling. So, uh, what the heck happened with, uh, Mike Mitchell? If we're talking about the same guy, he came in now he's originally from Tennessee, uh, West Tennessee, but he made a name for himself out in Don Owens territory. And there was some type of family situation that he came back to Tennessee and he's a hell of a hand and we were going to use him. And just as soon as he got here, he had to do an about face and I think either return home for his wife or his girlfriend or kids, some type of family situation that it, it just, he immediately, he was in one week and out the next. So after the match, we're talking about here, um, Meltzer would write this after the match, Jeff Jarrett, who had broken up his team with Fuller just a few weeks ago in a tease going heel came out to make the save and the moon dogs jumped on him and bloodied him up as well. Is this, I don't know. I'm asking, is this one of the first times you would have, uh, well, you know, done the deed. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, it definitely wasn't one of the first times. Um, no, it wasn't. This was the first few, probably the only feud that it was consistent deal. Most of the other times were, we'll call them one-offs to shoot the angle, you know, just 
that was the deal. One offs to shoot the angle, but not like on a consistent basis. A lot of guys, um, legends, we'll call them old timers. Some might say mm -hmm. they get very uncomfortable discussing that process. Are you uneasy about that? Or are you pretty comfortable with it? Actually doing it or discussing it, discussing it. Why is that like one of the, like this guy's a work and I buried him and this is a shoot and that's a da da da. I mean, we use all these insider terms, but then when it comes down to like, so like flair is fine with it. But if I was to ask Bruce, he'd be like, I don't want to talk about that. And I, yeah, I, I, and I, I, there's a lot of guys who are like that, but I guess what I'm trying to get into here is, do you have like a best practice? Like some guys kept putting their lips, some kept it in their wrist tape. Flair would famously keep it on a finger, blah, blah, blah. Where did you keep yours? Wrist, wrist. Conrad, you're so good natured. I, I think you understand where I'm coming from with this. Grown up in the business, third generation, we don't have to carry all that. It was a trade practice. Yes. And with all due respect, I totally understand that. But Conrad, I would be pretty safe to say if me and you and Cassio went down to Rosie's and it was a packed house and they said, Hey, uh, we're going to have to seat you with three guys. One's from the water department. One's an attorney and one's a landscaper. Do y'all mind sitting at the same table? No, that's fine. And I would be safe to say if the six of us sat down and we started talking about blading, they have no idea what we're talking about anyway. But if we went into the description of it, oh, they'd be one, horrified. One of the three would say, Hey, pal, what you're really dressing up is self mutilation. It is. Well, there's and, no doubt. And you realize that's a big issue in the teens' world. Matter of fact, it is, you know, it's scripturally written and all that kind of stuff. But so that's, I never ever want to make light of self mutilation. Oh, blading, no. yes. Blading, blading, it is, blading is, is, it's a part of our industry. And, Red actually does make green if, if you do it in the right circuit set of circumstances. It adds, just like Lance Russell said, hey, hey, uh, Mike Shields, uh, keep your camber rolling. We got a hell of a fight back here. Don't worry about it. I'll edit. That subtlety sold tickets without yeah. question. Blading sells tickets done. I hope that came out right. When, when right. done correctly. No, you can't. It's with everything else. Like you have to use, you know, moderation is the key to life, right? Bingo. And uh, well, that's the hard way. <laughs> and and if you're well, and I, and and my fat ass probably needs to learn a little more. But the point is, you know, that's that's the point you're trying to make. If it's in a money match in a money moment, and you're telling a story, and this adds to the drama and makes people want to see it again next week, then it's a viable piece of the business and that's the origin of why it was done and somehow we lost our way because Bingo. people realized well this really works and it sells magazines and it gets attention and so there almost became a subset of wrestlers who became for lack of a better word blood wrestlers and they did it every single time and i'm not just talking about when you're touring nwa champion like rick flair where you're working in the main event and trying to build to a return but i mean Hey, I just bleed every match. And we know guys who are on the independents who bleed every match and they bleed for the sake of bleeding, not necessarily to make episodic, compelling programming that you want to see next week. I could not agree more. Well said. And I think that is my, um, I, I just, I, I, I really want, I, because it is, you know, there's an underbelly, ugly side to it. And, and to get right into it, you look at the WWE set of circumstances they don't want to touch it because of sponsorships because of this conversation. And I get it. I totally get it. So, uh, I don't, I, I hope I answered your question. I like to be forthcoming and you hit the, but anyway, I don't mind discussing it, but I always want to make sure that we're not making light of it. It's a serious issue outside of the confines of wrestling. Yes. And even within the confines of wrestling, I think I you and say, I, yeah, I mean, I don't have to retell the story. But I was at a show where it looked like somebody was seriously hurt and I left. I was not comfortable with it. You know, 
it's all fun and games. And it's like, okay, well, this is kind of, I'm drinking a beer and having a good time with my friends. But then it was like, oh, wow. Somebody really might get hurt for real over this. I don't mean like a sprained ankle. I mean, like they're going to the ER right now. Yeah. I, I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't think it's necessary. And, and I know that there are, uh, things that you, that happen in wrestling, every single, what every single match that are dangerous and could be potentially life-threatening, but doing it just for the sake of doing it, uh, maybe not the best thing. Um, so anyway, but I, I just wanted to ask what was your best practice? Because we don't get this conversation from a lot of guys. I've heard some guys say, oh, you go across the forehead, not up and down because of the way it scars or repairs. And uh, of course, everybody knows that Rick would go high and he would put Neosporin on. And apparently eventually your skin just gives up and says, fuck him and his pigmentation. It's just this color now. Uh, but we've all seen like, you know, 25 years ago, Abdullah, the butcher was doing shoot interviews and putting poker chips and coins in the holes. Like, yeah, it'll sit there. And so there is a better way to do it, or maybe there's not, but there's certainly preferences. Did you have a preference or a best practice for, okay, if I got to do it, I'm going to be near the hairline and across, not up and down. What was the best practice? We know wrist tape now, but are there any other little tricks of the trade that you can share with us that we insatiable wrestling fans just want to know? Um, the forehead wrinkles horizontally. Yeah. Yes. So the guys that do it vertically, I've never really understood that because it's going against the grain. Literally. Uh, yes. Okay. So, um, I, I mean, j d look at my forehead. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I did definitely did my fair share, but, I, I it was a horizontal guy and I was taught by, I think one of the best in the business. He not only taught me how to throw a punch, but he taught me how to take care. And, uh, that look, that good looking man is still on Monday night raw well into his seventies. <laughs> so, uh, from what I've heard, you go down to the drugstore or what have you, you make your purchase, you get some athletic tape, you snap it in half. You just get the corner, you tape the bottom, you put it in your wrist tape, you peel it back at the apropos time. Maybe somebody else has a distraction going at the moment. You do your business, you either put it back or flat it and slide it over to the referee and he takes care of it from there. Am I missing anything else? Or is it you just your homework? Bingo. Yeah. Horizontal is it, right? Yeah. Everybody has a little bit of a different variation and different timing and all that kind of stuff. And you know, boy, you get granular on this. Sometimes if you're doing a storyline or my bad at doing an angle and I'm not in wrestling gear, black tape doesn't really go with the suit and tie. Uh just throwing that out there. So then you may have to have a handoff or a pass off or have it placed strategically. There's all kinds of David Copperfield deals, but again, it goes back to that subtlety. But if you see, Oh God, he, look what he's doing. The camera caught him cutting. You just go, Oh, man. well now that's normally now, again, I've never produced a wrestling show, but I feel like that piece is probably communicated ahead of time. Now, Hey, there's going to be a moment in the action where this happens. Now we might not be so explicit to say he's going to get color, but we'll say this is going to happen. Whatever it is. I don't know. So-and-so is going to hit so-and-so with a chain, but then he's going to go get some heat on a lady in the crowd or a manager or whatever. Shoot that. Give him a All chance right. to, can I do a little sidebar? Yeah. It'll be quick. Do you know how many times I've gone into the truck and I learned this through my years I, I just did. I've busted in a TV truck. Poor Keith Mitchell. What the F is going? How in the world can you possibly? And then I've learned through the years, I would walk right in. Keith, the agent tell you, nope. Talent tell you, nope. Referee tell you, nope. So you weren't informed. Nope. Okay. Communication's key to life. Bingo. And that is a pet peeve of double J well, and here's the thing, uh, there's been shows that we may have seen recently where you can see <laughs> it happen and it's sliding over. But again, if it's not communicated, it's not communicated, but excusable. I don't know if you saw coach K, uh, got, got beat uh, Saturday night, Duke coach, North Carolina. Sure. Uh, I hated that he lost his last game, but they were going out and the whole retirement deal. And he did an impromptu walked up to the microphone fans. I'm sorry. Our performance today was inexcusable. I'm like, damn, 
dude is laying it out there for his team. But anyway, that, that to me, what we're talking about, that's just being lazy and it's inexcusable. It truly is for a live television product to catch someone blading. It's inexcusable. Well, and there's also been times where like Lou Albano would be right in front of the camera oh. and, it and just do it anyway, but that's probably because he was drinking or whatever, but yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not talking about the silliness of that. I'm talking about, you know, but it's, it is a part of wrestling where, you know, and I'm not betraying any family secrets here, but you know, <laughs> Megan tells me growing up, man, every pillowcase in the house was bloody, you know, you'd wash them, but you know, it's a process to get that out, but dad was making towns and dad was doing his deal and his dad's tossing and turning and he's done his best to take care of it. There's going to be some, and she even remembers as a kid, he had one in his bag and as he's unloading his bag out, it comes, he doesn't realize it steps on it. It's in his foot. So just like, you know, the tiger who has something in his paw, little Megan has to figure out, okay, dad, I'll get it and pull it out of his foot because it is a regular part of wrestling, but for so long, there's been this, I don't know, clandestine. Oh, we don't talk about that. Can you but imagine what? telling that story at Rosie's to the landscaper? <laughs> no, no, but you know, yeah, it's weird. Like over my head is the big gold belt. And she's like, yeah, that was in the laundry room when I was a kid. And you know, I'd have to step on it to get to my laundry. So she just walked on that as a kid, all the kids. I mean, it's just part of it, but now we wrestling fans are like, oh my God, let's shine it up and put it on a shelf. And she's like, what a rib, what a couple of marks. This fucking no, thing. I, Hey, I signed some belts this weekend, Conrad. And just this guy, I mean, he it's, it's like his piece. And, and he told me about here's where big daddy cool signed this and this. And I just like, it's just it's part of our fandom. It's a fandom. It's really cool. Yes. I connect with that. So, uh, let's talk about, um, the blood in these days you're doing this on Saturday mornings at 10 AM, you know, these days, and this is a part of a bigger conversation because we're sidebarring a lot here today, but whatever it's good, <laughs> it's good content these days, whenever AEW gets a little color on TV, as they say, we'll hear that WWE put some sort of statement out about the barbaric practices and da da da. But then of course, they're going to do it too. They're usually just going to do it on pay-per-view. It's, it's all competition strategy. But yes. And I want to, I want to convey that here because the reality is if WWE can put some sort of damning statement out there about how we don't do this and we don't do that. A lot of fans would say, oh, well, that's not fair because they did it. Da, da, da. They didn't put the statement out for you, buddy. They put the statement out for ad agencies. Bingo. Because it's the bottom ad line driven. It's bottom line driven. If I can say, we won't do this on television. And that's what separates us from them. And that's why, because here's the other thing too. And I'm a huge AW fan. You can tell from listening to this show. I know a bunch of the folks there and I'm pulling for them. It was a fight this past weekend too. Yeah, we, We're both big fans. We watch everything they do. Can't wait to see more. Da, 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 da. But at the same time, I understand the brand is WWE. So if you were, let's say you're at Rosie's or you're walking through Walmart, a lot of people listening to this don't know what Rosie's is, but everybody knows what Walmart is. If somebody says, Hey man, you're a big jacked up dude. What do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a wrestler. The first thing that person will say is you mean like WWE or WWF? They will not say, Oh, you mean like AEW? And that's not a knock. It's like saying if Jeff and I were to go to lunch and he says, I'll have a Coke. And they say, well, we have Pepsi. Jeff might say, well, that's what I prefer. Well, why the hell did you say Coke? If you prefer Pepsi, it's the brand. I wouldn't say to Jeff, hand me a tissue. I'd say, Hey man, you got a Kleenex. I wouldn't say, Hey man, I, I cut my finger. Do you have a bandage? No, I'd say, give me a band aid. WWF is the brand. WWE is the brand. So I'm saying all that to say, I understand when we have the conversation about, uh, self mutilation or color or blood or however, whatever phrase we want to use when WWE puts out an anti-statement sort of throwing shade at AEW, buddy, it's about advertising dollars. It ain't about whether or not that's good for business or not. Because behind the, the paywall on Peacock, well, it's game on. Uh, there aren't, there are no advertisers there, but this is not prime time or late night television. This is not behind a paywall on pay-per-view. This is on Memphis television, which once upon a time, not in this era, but once upon a time, seven out of 10 households were watching. So this isn't something that we're going to try to slip by. If somebody's bleeding on Saturday morning on Memphis, 
half the freaking city knows the most expensive spot still at during this time on the television station the most coveted spot on wmc tv still in the 90s i found that little tidbit lately go ahead the idea being most like an american idol back in the day 20 years ago that was the most expensive time you could buy if you wanted a commercial in there it's going to cost the most money now week in week out no matter what tv shows on the 10 o'clock news is the number one time the, the six o'clock news is the number two time. That's just the way life is. But the idea that you get that on Saturday mornings, which is usually reserved for bullshit infomercials <laughs> or old reruns or old cartoons from the fifties. Hey, hey goods. Yeah. It, it, it's just nonsense. Throw away as they call it in cable back then. And even 10 years ago, dollar a holler stuff, meaning I'll give you $500. Give me five, 500 commercials. That's the thing people did a dollar, a holler. The concept being, Hey man, I might pay it, play it at 1. AM. I might play it at 5. PM. Maybe nobody's watching cause it's three 30, but the point is you're going to get 500 commercials for 500 bucks. That is the way a lot of the tonnage in television sales was done, but this is the show, even though it's Saturday at 10 AM, it's the show and you're bleeding your ass off. <laughs> Was there any backlash in the early nineties for that? No. And, and uh, again, just the context and how the business has evolved, good, better, and different. It was, that was what happened in wrestling. Yeah. It didn't happen. You know, you didn't see it every Saturday morning for 52 weeks. You saw it on occasion. Hey, oh my gosh, I can hear my old man just preach about that. It's got to count. It's got to mean something. You don't need to do that. Uh, we're having a tag match. All four of you guys don't need to get it. Let one guy get it. Okay, one guy from each team get it. All four don't need to. I mean, just all the different lessons because less is more even in that, but it still meant something. But Saturday mornings, if the storyline, if the angle, if the situation called for it, it happened and there was zero backlash. It's amazing that times have changed as much as they have. Let's talk about the next big moment. It's December 9th at the mid South Coliseum. Dave Meltzer would write moon dogs, AKA Larry spot Booker and bill spike Smithson retained the USWA tag team titles, beating Jeff Jarrett and Robert Fuller. When spot came off the middle rope with a bone to the throat on Fuller, who was injured. And we'll be taking a few weeks off. Do you remember why Fuller was written out? Was the plan always to pivot to Lawler? Was he unhappy? He just didn't like working with the moon dogs time to learn a new hold. You, you know? know what? We may need to do a watch along. This is just off the top of the head. Polly B. If you're going to listen to this, get tuned up. Me and Dr. Tom need to do a watch along because Dr. Tom coined this phrase because I had numerous partners because Lawler wouldn't go around the horn, but obviously Lawler was the money, but uh, again, I referenced, um, I'll call him Colonel Rob, <laughs> Colonel Parker. Um, you've heard of bronchitis, hadn't you? Oh yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there can be elbow tendonitis and all that. There was a rampant type of, of flare up that was going on during this time that Dr. Tom liked to refer to as moondogitis. And when you call it moondogitis, you wanted no part of chairs or boards or none of that crap. So Robert, I think he was actually the one that uh, was was the original Moondog-itis uh, recipient. <laughs> he wanted no part of it. So he needed to take a little break. It's, um, he took his jump rope and he went home. Why can't he <laughs> Not an hour. <laughs> you want to tell that story? No. Okay. I didn't think uh, maybe, so. No, not Dallas. Maybe, I don't know. So awesome Kong is going to save you at a TV taping. Uh, he's, uh, going to be saving you from the moon dogs, but this isn't the awesome Kong that we know from more recent years in your era in TNA, but Dwayne McCullough, what can you tell us about Dwayne? Big mass guy. I mean, probably he might've gone 400 pounds, 350 big guy. Um, and again, they, we, as we progressed into this angle, I had numerous partners throughout the whole run Lawler 
obviously made Memphis and Louisville and Nashville and, and Evansville. And so that's where the, the feud and the money and really Lawler's promos Lawler could tell a story and make sense. And we did our very best again, another territory mentality and Lawler, if you're going to use a chair, why are we using it? If you're going to use a board, not do light bulbs and barbed wire and crazy shit, just for the sake of doing it and integrate it. And Lawler's the one who really, for lack of a better word, tied the whole program together and made it have episodes. Even after we left here. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, you want to play something there, Conrad? No, but anyway, no. uh, I, uh, Awesome Kong was a, a, a big guy uh, that, that could be my partner for a week or two. He wasn't long. So after this big save, Robert Fuller cuts a promo promising revenge and promising to return, but then you get abused for it. They wind up hanging you. And, uh, this is also in our clips where you can check it out at uh, myworldmoondogs.com. Uh, hanging folks is not something that we see a ton. We saw a little bit recently with punk and MJF, but once upon a time, that was a, a no, no, but you guys were doing it here in 91. No problem. You know, and it's so easy to understand again, it's relatable. It's, you know, you, you can do it. Um, some guys I I've seen Jimmy Jack funk, uh, years ago, you know, you can get really reckless with that and snap a guy pretty good, but, um, you know, moon dogs, it, it, it's, 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 it's a, it's a great visual to see a, a guy hung on the top rope with his feet dangling just above the, you know, it's, it's, uh, again, not to be repetitive. It's very visual. It's, it's easy to understand. And it's, uh, you know, moon dog. I can just hear Larry Latham. Say so walking in the dressing room, Jeff, when you get a little heat, I said, Larry, <laughs> you get heat every week. No, we're going to make it extended. That's kind of the art that Larry would do is that we would have three or four comebacks in a match that you think, oh, they're going home. Now we're going to see the finish. And Larry would cut them back off and like, damn. And, and so the moon dogs, people, not only did they hate them, they, they, they kind of feared them. Cause it's like, these guys are indestructible, but they sold and it matched their gimmick so good. And again, I, it, moon dogs, my world, moondogs.com. If people watch that original video, it's literally, it was a hot summer day, uh, early eighties. And they came out to my dad's house and my dad tells a good story, but they had to create this moon dog persona. And there was a little, uh, summer pine, which means it only comes up in the summer, but real small, but you know, in August moss grows over it and it's stagnant and it's kind of stinks. And, uh, they rolled the videotape and those guys got out there in that mossy water, but it created that image again, a wrestling video in the early eighties was kind of new stuff. Um, but it wasn't a pretty boy, fabulous ones, bill Dundee kind of vibe. It was these heels and Richard Lee's moon dog theme. It just, it, that kind of set the tone from the very beginning. And we would, uh, and here's another little note, Conrad, that original video that, that uh, aired in the early eighties, when we reintroduced, reintroduced them in the nineties, we would run that video every couple of weeks just to reestablish, you know, it's 60 seconds, 90 seconds to again, reestablish who these guys were. We used it often. Great character development piece. So you're going to team up with Fuller at the mid South Coliseum to take on the moon dogs. And, and listen, the mid South Coliseum is a big building, but you guys had to get creative because it's not like you're bringing in a new big star every single week. So oftentimes we see the same match week after week after week but we have to make it just a little different. And that's probably where you really run into your most trouble as a promoter, because you got to get creative. It would almost be as if we're going to give you the same ingredients to cook supper every single night, but you can't feed them the same thing every night. You got to switch it up a little bit because they'll burn out on it. So you get a little bit of a twist here or there and make them want to sign up and come eat again. Right. Yep. And you know, one of the things that Larry was really good about is he didn't mind doing the job, but he knew once the people saw Larry or, or spike or Cujo later, or once you saw them get beat, that's, I don't say it, it was over, but you know, you, they just, they, they, you didn't, you didn't pin them 
until it really meant something. And that was the whole kind of vibe of, damn, we want to see Lawler and Jarrett finally win. That, that was the deal. Almost win, almost win, almost win. All right. This week we're winning, you know, it's, it, that's in a lot of ways, the art of drawing money, make them pay to see the heels get beat. So next up, we've uh, got you on TV teaming up with Fuller, who's going to return from injury to take on Jeff Gaylord and the Sandman. Yes, that Sandman. The Moondogs are attacking, but this time the baby faces get the advantage and bloody up the Moondogs. The Sandman in Memphis. How about it? You didn't think you'd read his name during this episode, did you? I actually knew that he had been there before, but it's still just wild, is it not? Yeah, think about this, you know, he he was a part of this moon dog, and then you look at his persona and the ECW vibe. You know, there's it's just it's kind of uh again the other night that Duke Carolina game, they were talking about all the, the the coaching trees, you know, that Dean Smith and Coach K and this guy coached under them and this guy coached just how it spreads out. You know, you, you kind of look at the Tupelo brawl and kind of just what has grown from it over the years. So, yep, Sam Mann and Jeff Gaylord. What a team. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, now, earlier we talked about um, how there were other promotions that were a lot bigger and different than Memphis, whether it was WCW or the WWF. But do you have a long-term goal in mind with this program? I mean, we know in that era, it feels like Vince would lay out, okay, pal, here's next year's WrestleMania. Now we work backwards, but when you're doing it 52 weeks at a time and you got, I'm not going to say a shoestring budget, but you're not really able to offer the same security and, and quality of life that you could, if you were with the WBF or WCW, there's a lot of moving parts. It's probably pretty tough to have a real payoff plan for all this. Right? So I had this conversation. I don't want to say often, but multiple times. Um, so what year would have been the great American bash late eighties, I think came into Memphis. 85 was the first one. And then 86 is when they did a whole tour. Okay. So, so I started April of 86 and I want to say 86, 87. Well, anyway, so I couldn't remember the first time me, not a part of the conversation, but I was lucky enough to be in the room. And I look back on those times, my dad, I don't want to say he was anti big show mentality, but he, he understood you build to a big show. It's going to take you weeks, if not months to follow that. So why? And you know, the old funny adage is Nick Gildas would say greatest card ever signed right here in Nashville, Tennessee. Every week is the greatest card, but it's all in that the impressions on why do you want to make one show much bigger? Now we understand when pay-per-view entered, it's the whole big show mentality, but my father with the 52 weeks a year, I can make more money by making every show big, but not shooting for the big wide and going for that big show mentality, which subtly tells your audience, oh, these other ones aren't big. So I'll just wait for the big show to come next year or next month or three months from now, make it consistently episodic every week. And it goes against the grain of today's, you know, uh, era of, you know, now you see WWE doing a stadium show in Vegas and Dallas and Nashville. And they had one earlier in the year, you know, that the whole, the big show mentality, uh, but that's all pay-per-view driven live event driven in the same market. My father was not a big fan of, of, of big show mentality. So no, we didn't really have an end, you know, point that from a creative perspective, we didn't have to go far other than the bottom line. When it quit drawing, you change horses, you change. It's that simple. Well, that's a, a great rule of thumb because we see that all the time in modern wrestling, but back then, boy, it mattered a lot more because you're trying to compete really from underneath. You can't really compete with the WWF and WCW. So you got to make do how you can, but as we kick off 1992, it, we know we're going to be eventually getting into Jerry Lawler being the tag team partner. And he is, and still probably is the biggest draw in the history of Memphis. Oh, for sure. But as we're doing research for this, the moon dogs are just devastating guys and squash matches on TV. I mean, they're just killing people. So I see how this moon dog, is a real thing. Um, 
<laughs> but January and sixth and seventh in Memphis and Louisville, the moon dogs beat you and fuller. And then we start that, that shift over to Lawler. Did Lawler have moon dog itis? No Lawler. That's, you know, Lawler's a tough son of, I mean, he would, he had no problem giving and receiving. And, you know, when I look back as far as headshots, you know, a, a chair is, you know, you, you can block it and all this, but we were using these one by six boards, Conrad, and it folks, again, my world moondogs.com. And you look at the ass whooping that the moon dogs gave out every Saturday morning that those enhancement talent, they were not called enhancement talent these days. They got paid $25 to go in <laughs> and, and take a severe ass whooping. Um, but no Lawler, um, you know, as the, as the program got to percolating and me and Robert were drawing some money with the, with, with, with the moon dogs and look, they weren't easy matches by any stretch. Lawler was, he saw like, okay, I can take this program to a whole nother level. If the King gets involved it just was you know, obviously money, but we had sort of baked the cake and we're building it. And, you know, at some point, gosh, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but Tom Pritchard, Eric Embry, dirty white boy, Robert Fuller came back. Uh, we just mentioned uh, awesome call. We, I had multiple partners, but when Lawler inserted himself, it took the program to another level. Get even more from the hottest new podcast going my world with Jeff Jarrett over at adfreeshows.com. Let me get granular here for a minute, folks. Not only can you get the entire my world episode library with zero ads, new episodes come your way each week early ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks a month. We've also got tons of exclusive my world bonus content waiting for you. Plus unique interactive experiences with your old pal, double J you get to jump on and ask Jeff questions. And if you joined us in Chicago this year for top guy weekend, you got to hang out the entire weekend, 100% the best value in all of wrestling. Strut on over to adfreeshows.com right now to sign up. Let's, um, let's talk about how we get to the observer here. The biggest thing from here is one of those tape collectors must get. It took place on January 17th in Kennett, Missouri and aired on Saturday on WMC TV in Memphis. It started as a tag team match with the moon dogs versus Jarrett and Fuller. Fuller ended up being taken out of action when manager Richard Lee busted a garbage can over his head. Jerry Lawler made the save and he and Jarrett brawled with the moon dogs all over the building into the concession stands with mustard and broken glass and Jarrett's shoulder bled real bad. There were brooms, broken Coke bottles, broken tables, etc. This was reminiscent of the famous concession stand brawl of the late seventies with Lawler and Bill Dundee against Wayne Ferris and Larry Latham. And one of the eighties, one of the early eighties with Hatsushi Onita and Masafuchi against Ricky Morton and Eddie Gilbert. So take us through this day. You referenced it several weeks ago, right before the big game changer show in January. What do you remember of this? How was your shoulder cut? Just walk us through and talk us through being in the building that day. What was planned? What was called on the fly? All that jazz. So Kennett, Missouri, home of Cheryl Crow, was a regular spot show. And I say regular spot show, probably ran shows there, I don't know, twice a year, maybe, maybe three times. I don't know. But it was a, a, a good community center uh, venue that uh, <clears throat> my grandfather, Eddie Marlin, um, you know, great building deal, um, four wall deal, which means we just paid rent and we also got concessions. So it was a moneymaker, but that's, that's just one part of it. So as I said, me and, and Fuller and the moon dogs had got the program up and running. It was going, the people were responding, uh, as we said, back in those days, the moon dogs had a lot of heat and, um, it was like, all right, what can we do to take this to another level? And, my father and Lawler was like, Hey, um, <clears throat> let's take this out of the old playbook. I think it'll work. Um, Jeff, you up for it? Yep. So we had to get our camera crew. Cause you don't usually have a camera crew in Kennett, Missouri on a Friday night. Um, but you know, we got the camera crew and got to the building early and like, and, and I get it this day and age, but at, at WWE, when I was producing, you know, if, if, 
we did several of these, but you had to have a mock merchandise stand, a mock concession stand. It's, you know, a prop concession stand. We did it at Universal. Well, we basically said, all right, here's the real concession stand that people are buying Cokes and popcorn and everything, hot dogs and all that. So, Eddie, uh, in the last match, uh, make sure, A, you have all the money from back there. B, uh, if you've got any, you know, whatever your real concession stand uh, equipment Make sure you get that put away in a corner and make sure you have plenty of everything out and we're going to head back there and kick ass. And there's going to be, so, so, you know, we get there and there's no walkthrough. There's, there's no, not even a lot of discussion. It's we're going to give them a DQ finish at the end of the match, but it just keeps going. And I can just remember saying, okay, Lawler, when you're ready to head to the back, I'll follow your lead. And, you know, we got the bell rung and the DQ and the match had a wild vibe to it, but we stayed around ringside. But as we headed to the back, and it's one of those things that, Conrad, you know, I mean, and I know guys uh, or, or folks listening to this, you know, there's some matches that just click and storylines or in-ring promos or whatever it may be. It's just like, okay, that was on time. This vibe, and again, I'd had a lot of brawls with Larry Latham. And Spike with, with Robert, I just had a lot of brawls with them, but Kennett was one of those nights that the timing was right. The fans were right. Uh, again, I, I look at some shows now that go four and five hours. It's just the people are exhausted. We sort of had a rule of thumb on a spot show, uh, start at seven 30 and even with two intermissions, you got them out of there before 10 o'clock. So they're not burnt out. So a two and a half hour show. So the people weren't, weren't worn out. They were ready to see the main event. And then when they saw, and we gave them the old proverbial Pat Patterson, a little something extra, but that little something extra was a brawl in the concession stand with, I mean, glass bottles of pickles and, Oh, I mean, it was just carnage back there. And again, this will be a clip on there, but it was just a wild brawl. And we had been brawling back there, I don't know, five, six, seven minutes. And Larry Latham reached up with a big trash can. And when he reached up, he hit the lights that were overhead and the, the exact kind of same light tubes that GCW uh, uses week in and week out. But one of them fell and Conrad, you know, Look, it's the what ifs, but man, it fell and gashed my shoulder. And when it hit, I knew it like dug in, but I'm like, ah, it'll be all right. And then 30 seconds later, I realized, oops, it's a good one. Uh, it's a good gash, good scar. Uh, but it's one of those things that cuts so deep. It took it a second to bleed and then it really started bleeding and we kept brawling and, you know, Lawler's like, hey, you all right, Jeff? I mean, but you know, it was just a wild, crazy brawl but we were all over the place and there was no spots. You just beat the shit out of each other back and forth. And you had to have kind of know how to have to do that ebbed and flow. And that's another thing Lawler taught me, you know, early in these kind of matches, not in this program, but like you don't want one baby face selling and one baby face kicking ass for too long because the people don't, the whole arena doesn't know how to cheer or boo or get behind the heat. So you sort of, it's like an orchestra. You got to have, either both baby faces selling or both baby faces coming back. So it is a hell of a brawl, Conrad. I got a little too granular there, but, uh, no, I love it. It was, uh, it, but it was a brawl that clicked and the cameras were rolling and it's the thing that kind of set me and Lawler, um, set the hook for the Lawler Jarrett teaming against the moon dogs. I, um, the little kid in you, after it's done, I know you're bleeding and there's part of you that's just got the adrenaline. And then afterwards you got to pissed off. <laughs> I was pissed off that I was cut for real. I get that. But a little later with the benefit of hindsight, when you're out of the moment, man, Moondog was in all those Tupelo concession brawls and Jerry Lawler. He's the icon, the legend, probably your wrestling role model, your favorite wrestler as a kid. And now here you are, you got to do that thing that you love so much as a kid. Maybe it didn't pay $10,000, but Lord, you got to be thinking, God, this is why I love this stuff. I'm right in the middle of it. Eddie Marlin walked up to me 
and he would say, call me son. Son, it don't get no better than that. You know, he, he, he loved it, you know, and he was there and listening to people and he would gauge it. And, you know, a guy like Eddie doesn't watch it as a fan. He watched it as a businessman. And then my dad got to see the footage and you know, that light Lawler would, he would never over compliment you, but he's like, yeah, Jeff, that's good. That that's really good. And then Larry came and, and said that, that, that made us some money tonight. It was the kind of the business mentality of it wasn't rah, rah, rah. Uh, let's give you a big hug and oh, what a performance. Uh, oh, what a good vibe. Oh, pardon this Conrad, but oh, what a five-star kind of, yeah. you know, none of that. It was, you've been there in business deals. Okay. We just did a deal that's going to make us money and it's going to affect our bottom line. That was the vibe and feedback that I got from Eddie and Lawler and my dad and Larry Latham. It's uh it's super fun. In Memphis on the 13th, the Moon Dogs defeat you and Fuller, and then again in Louisville the next day. On the 20th, you're in Memphis, and there's a bloodbath, according to uh, Meltzer, between the Moon Dogs, you and Lawler. Uh, and at, at this point, it's almost like farewell to Fuller. He's really effectively taken out of the storyline. But on some level, you're probably more excited about that, right? Like Well, I got it. Look, Robert at this stage of his career, he didn't want to take chair shots every night, and I got that. I absolutely. I mean, it wasn't even, we would chuckle and giggle about it. And me and Tom again, as we get into it, but no, the, the, the real deal was Robert didn't want to do it. Um, and I understood it. No big deal stage in his career, but you know, Lawler, uh, um, <clears throat> part owner of the territory, highly incentivized to do good business. Um, Larry and, uh, Latham and, and Bill Smithson, highly incentivized. Uh, they wanted payoffs and they knew that they weren't going to have any hurricane runners, which w you know, was just being created back then. So we all came to the table to make money and that's what we were after. Such a different animal, huh? Conrad. So it's different. A, so in different. today's world guys don't have matches to say, Oh, I'm going to get paid from that. Y you and I had a conversation off air and I'll edit this out if you want me to, but we saw some stuff that was happening, some behavior. And I said, Hey man, these guys grew up in a television rights era. They've mm -hmm. never had to figure out how to get paid on the house and how many tickets I sold. And because that is a bygone era. Now, once upon a time, Hey man, there's 20,000 people out there. I make a bunch of money. Oh shit. There's only 1200. I ain't doing so hot today. These days, 3,000, 30,000 get paid the same. Now, of course, a lot of folks would say, oh, well, that's not true because that's a downside. Buddy, what you're talking about is when they were running 150 or 200 house shows a year. They're not doing that anymore. They're just not. Um, it's a different era. The, the pay has increased, and that's a wonderful thing. I think you and I are both all for that. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the lion's share of the cash should go to the talent. I'm all for that. But it is a different mentality in terms of back then, man, we're running the same freaking town every week and we got to figure out how to get creative and how to make them want to be here. We can't just go shit on them and hope they show up next week as a baby face. Like, no, I, as a, you got to cater to the fans as a baby face, you got to make them hate you and want them to pay to see you get your ass beat. And by the way, the most masterful person of at that in the last 20 years, there's two number one, Floyd Mayweather. And it ain't close. And then it's Conor McGregor. But more recently in the last few years, a couple of freaking YouTubers have figured out how to do it. And I'm talking about Logan Paul. And of course his brother, Jake Paul, Jake Paul was the biggest villain in sports a year ago. He's a YouTuber, but he figured out how to make people want to pay to see him get his ass kicked. Not sure he had his fans and it was a loud, proud, vocal, probably minority. Everybody else in mainstream America who's buying that pay-per-view is like, let's watch this kid get his ass kicked by a real fighter. Yep. And it didn't happen. But that is not the mentality that a lot of wrestlers have to think about when they punch in in, in wrestling in 2022 because I get paid the same way. Somebody comes and tells me, here's what we're doing. And now my, that doesn't mean they're not trying, by the way. I want to be clear. I'm not disparaging wrestlers. I'm saying they go out and do their very best to put on the best performance they can in the ring. 
But as far as being very business-like about what makes more money and what makes less money, they don't have to think about that. They think about, Hey, here's what they want me to do. Let me go put on the best performance I can. And they do the performances in wrestling athletically, the physicality it's greater than ever, but the ability to draw money, nobody's really been taught how to do that because we don't do that. And we haven't done it in a long, long time. Am I wrong? Not at all. And this is for another podcast and maybe not really for public consumption, but Conrad, have I ever shared with you, me and Dean Broadhead's conversation about wrestler metrics? No. I should one day, not today, but Wait, it, is, this, it, is this the contractor conversation? Cause Bruce and I talked about that once. Uh, well, what do you, if this guy just leaves, we'll just, we'll get another guy. Oh no, so, no, 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 okay. that, no, 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 no. This is, I went to Dean and didn't say it as eloquently as you did. And I said, look, we've got social media metrics. We've got merchandise metrics. We got minute rate play by play. We also have a overarching some way to figure out that this guy is not going to get paid just on opinion. Cause at the end of the day, and I don't know if this comes out right or wrong. So Conrad put my foot, uh, take my foot out of my mouth. If I say it wrong, Vince's opinion and Tony's opinion is what drives the paycheck. End of story. Would that be safe to say? It's their opinion. What? What's? What, is it ratings or box office or T-shirts or you know what is the metric used today to pay guys? Television rights, I guess. Just whatever you can negotiate. That's the brand. Yeah. Yeah, that's the brand. I'm talking about individual pay. So yeah, I, but look, it, and I'm not again. It's 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 how things have evolved. But you hit it, Mayweather, Conor McGregor. Paul boys, uh, but you know, in sports batting averages and points per game and minutes on the court and all those metrics that, that, that are, that are used in shoot. I mean, God almighty baseball, basketball, football, and, 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 and hockey. I mean, they really drill it down with all the computer stuff with every player across all leagues and all this kind of stuff. But yeah, it's, um, actually driving and moving the needle is something that I think would greatly benefit the talent, not just the promoters, not just, I think it would greatly benefit the entire industry to figure out some type of metric. Maybe it exists. I don't know, but I don't know. Good conversation though, Conrad, really good conversation. It's really fun to talk about the, the mechanics of wrestling, but today we're really talking about the moon dogs. So okay. you said, you said earlier, you know, I, I want to just press pause for a minute. Meltzer referred to this match on the 20th in Memphis as a bloodbath. And you, as we're talking about the practice of blading said red turns to green. And that is an old school wrestling phrase. Um, was that always drilled in your mind? Who was the first person you heard say that? I mean, the first time I heard that said was that goof who did the John Stossel. What was his name? Where he, talked about, where he talked about blading. Not, no, he did the interview. The guy who was sort of banned from wrestling for a long, not day, not the guy who slapped him, not John Stossel. Yeah. He's talking to John Stossel, but he doesn't slap him. It's the same deal. Oh Lord. Come on, man. We just did a whole thing on him. Uh, back. is he a talent? Yeah. And he got blackballed from fucking wrestling. Come on, oh, man. Eddie Mansfield. Eddie Mansfield. Thank you. So Eddie Mansfield is the first guy I heard say that phrase. Red turns and green means when you get blood, that turns into money. Okay. Uh, Bill Dundee. I okay. think Bill Dundee, uh, as uh, before I broke into the business, uh, you know, Bill would just, Hey kid, who's getting you, you know, whatever. But that's, I think to my, yeah, I, I just remember Bill saying, I'm like, Hmm, what's that mean? It was before I even really understood it. It's, uh, it's amazing to think about, uh, how the business has changed, but let's, uh, let's talk about where it gets a little more interesting. The observer says the attempted murder and attempted rape hour took place on television this past Saturday. I love it all Dave. started rather <laughs> innocently when the moon dogs destroyed a few jobbers and then beat them up after the match with chair shots. They aired a clip from the previous Saturday night from Memphis with Jerry Lawler and Jerry Jarrett versus the moon dogs for the USWA titles. 
Richard Lee pulled the old 83 Kaufman routine of coming out to the ring, all bandaged, but it wasn't really Lee. Jarrett was pounding on the bandaged up fake Richard Lee when the real Richard Lee came out and interfered, leading to Jarrett getting pinned. Now, the next clip from the Coliseum, which drew 1,300 fans in a $7,700 house, which is considerably better than usual in this era, saw Eric Embry defend the Southern title against Tony Anthony. Embry bought, brought in handcuffs and somehow Anthony reversed things and Embry got himself handcuffed to the ropes. At this point, Anthony pulled down Embry's trunks and dirty white girl came out and whipped Embry with a belt. At this point, they went back to live television and Embry and valet CJ came out and were furious. And it wound up with Tony Falk handcuffing Anthony to the ropes while Eric went to get revenge on dirty white girl. Embry started trying to rip off her clothes and ripped off her top, revealing the dreaded black bra before he could get her pants off. Lawler and Jarrett made the save. I guess they were just trying to be topical since the Tyson trial is the biggest thing in the news out of Indiana. Uh, they announced that the return of Austin idol, which should pick up a gate. So we'll just, we'll pause for right there. What do you remember about this angle? Because I, I, I'll tell you when th this was kind of, I guess you could call it the locker room chatter. Conrad is that. Larry Latham would whack the hell out of you with the chair and you better give it back to him the same way. Same with the boards. So I'm not saying our stuff was real, but we laid our stuff in and there was chatter in the dressing room. Well, hell, how in the hell can we go out there with a headlock takeover, get it again, just simple high spots and wrestling. People ain't going to buy it. The, the tone of it. They were waiting for that crazy hardcore before it was called hardcore wild ass stuff. So we pushed our envelope to the ultra violence. Eric wanted, because Eric creative mind booked a lot of places very, he says, okay, we need to push our envelope and we're going to go with sexual innuendo, so to speak, not so much the rate, but Hey, we're going to show some TNA here, that type deal. So I remember that conversation going on and look, dirty white boy, Tony Anthony had been a big heel in the territory and switched him baby face with and then Eric was the heel. But anyway, those guys, at the end of the day, they were busting their ass trying to make a buck and and trying to um, draw money. It's, uh, I don't know. <laughs> In hindsight, teasing a rape, maybe not the best thing. Uh, now, come on. I think you're pushing it, teasing a rape. M maybe a... Can it be put under the context? We're going to embarrass this, uh, female out there. Um, I mean, what was Eric really going to rape her or just strip her top off? We started trying to pull her pants off. Well, okay. So he's going to embarrass her. I mean, what's he going to do with once he tears her pants off? I mean, I get where you're going. I get where you're going. Well, here's the thing though. The, there is the, you know, a lot of times what happens in wrestling is a reflection of what's happening in real life. A few years after this, in the middle of WrestleMania, we're going to cut away to a runaway Bronco chase on the freeway. Now, why would they just do that? They did it because it was topical for what happened with OJ Simpson. This is the era where Mike Tyson raped a girl. Okay. I so, never drew that analogy back then, but I, I see where you're going. But I'm just saying like, yeah, yeah I hear you. Piper and gold dust. It makes no sense for there to be a runaway Bronco. That's stupid. Pop it's culture. like, Oh, I get it. I see what they're doing. Pop culture. Yeah. Maybe what you guys need to just let everybody know. It ain't nothing to worry about. Just have RoboCop walk out there. That's what WCW did. <laughs> so they announced the return of Austin idol, which should have picked up the gate for the uh, February 2nd afternoon card. Since idol has always been a good draw in Memphis. Anyway, idol was supposed to be at television, but he hadn't arrived. So Lawler did a squash match and the moon dogs jumped in with Jarrett making the save. Richard Lee came in followed by Robert Fuller, followed by a new heel called the flaming star star threw fire at Fuller. Finally, idol showed up having just arrived to the building and cleaned house using his briefcase during the face comeback idols briefcase opened and Lawler threw shaving cream on the moon dogs. Then came the attempted murder interview. Idol did one of those all time classic interviews. It said that Richard Lee had sent someone to sabotage his private airplane and called it an attempted murder. 
Dave Brown, who does the weather on the news for channel five in Memphis says, if that's true, those are some serious allegations, same show, maybe saw something we shouldn't have with a lady. And now that's an allegation. Y'all tried to murder me. And oh, and in between we threw fucking fire. This is just a random Saturday in Memphis, Bubba. And, and listen, can you imagine? I may be dating myself here, but you have to really. So you live in Memphis and you watch the six o'clock news and the 10 o'clock news and Monday night football and whatever other sitcom during this era, friends or Seinfeld, or that's probably anyway, you're watching TV, but then all of a sudden your weatherman, Al Roker says, yep. <laughs> Tell you what, if those allegations are true, Idol, that's some pretty serious stuff. I think there's a, you know, it's the context. Dave Brown was on television, not just on Saturday mornings for 90 minutes. He was on seven days a week telling you it's going to be partly cloudy today with a chance of showers. Right. It, it, and so to digest how big Memphis wrestling was or, or to this audience, it was just different. And so if Dave is looking at Austin idol and not cracking a smile, when he accuses someone of attempted murder, well, hell Conrad, let's press charges. It should be attempted murder, but no, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to put that SOB in jail and make him go to trial for attempted murder charges. We're going to settle this score Monday night, pal. We're going to scuttle it Monday night and flame and star bring your, uh, flash paper along with you. <laughs> I mean, it's Memphis. It's Saturday morning wrestling. I love it. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's all things Memphis. Um, uh, idol winds up teaming with Lawler on the 2nd of February. You're going to beat Lee in a cage. Uh, Austin idol is a name that, you know, we see pop up every now and again, if you're keeping up with everything that's happening, he'll pop up every now and again uh, on, uh, impact I had to, with NWA. Yeah. That's what I meant. Not impact NWA, my apologies. But when yeah. I was in St. Louis this past summer, I had the, the chance to, to be at that show, uh, when flair came back and they were running, uh, that really cool venue for the first time. And I was so excited to be there at the chase, but still that's the first time I met Austin idol. And I'd heard all about Austin. I'd seen some of the old stuff, but never actually met him. Really nice guy. I loved hearing Bruce tell his story about uh, maybe Idol getting into the water filtration game and trying to, you know, so, did you hear about this? But he was, oh, God. so apparently, once upon a time, Austin Idol got into selling water filters or water filtration for your home. And he says, have you seen that people are paying $5 for bottles of water? Do you know, Evian, have you ever looked at that? Have you seen that? The people are paying $5 I for bottle of water. Bruce do this. Well, hypothetically, Jeff, how would you say, how would you pronounce Evian backwards? Naive. Know. You'd have to be naive to spend $5 on bottled water. That's why you need the Austin idle filtration system for your home. I love it. Fantastic stuff. But I know your dad, you've even said here on the show before, boy, he had an Austin Idol, one of the top stars in Memphis there for a long time, but oh, he, yes. he, had, he had a hokey pokey relationship with him to say the least. Um, can you add some context to who Austin Idol was as a draw and how challenging he was for your dad? So folks out there, my world listeners, Google Austin Idol Memphis or his real name, Mike McCord. He was in a, uh, the plane crash over Tampa Bay. Uh, right. Is that right? Yeah. He, I mean, yeah. He, he's been around, um, but I, he's all idols. One of the guy that, you know, backstage, what's up, Jackson, me and Paul Heyman riding on the jet. Uh, gosh, we, we, you've got to hear Paul Heyman's impersonation of Austin idol talking to a young Jeff Jarrett. And I, we would do it on the plane when we were waiting on Vince to get on. I mean, f some really funny stuff, but anyhow, uh, idle like handsome Jimmy there when the red lights, not on their business guys and this and that and all that. But man, when that red light goes on, Mike McCord could change into Austin idol just in the drop of hat. And, and, you know, you watch Paul Heyman's fired up interviews. Like when he gets real, well, no, look at all of his interviews. I mean, shifting of gears, um, idle was so good at it, but look, idol was a businessman and 
he didn't mind telling my old man, nope, I want my money and I want a little more if the house is there. It's just a really shrewd businessman. And so a lot of times him and my dad were oil and water and Ida would get his money and my dad would say, I will never, ever, Jerry Lawler, shoot me if I even say the words Austin Idol. I'm never, he's never coming back to Memphis. I don't care. Hell, I'll go out of business before I'll bring that guy back. Jerry, house was down two grand last night. What do you think? Ah, oh, shit. Let me call Austin, see if he's available next Monday. I mean, it's, it's, it was that kind of relationship because all we, Austin was always box office in Memphis, always. Cause he could talk. He would talk them into the building because he didn't know, I mean, you know, his, his work rate, if you will, it wasn't through the roof, but he knew how to talk and was over like Rover in Memphis. So we're going to be working, um, or you're going to be working with Lee in a cage match here. And that's probably a night off from the bloodbaths here. I mean, it is still a cage match, but, uh, if you had your druthers Lee in a cage or the moon dogs bleeding all over the building. So there's a little psychology for this, but yeah, it was Lee in the cage, but I had sort of carried the water and Larry Latham would use those terms in the program. And so you bring idol in and idol is, you know, all about, we're hoping that the house is up, but okay. Here's Jared, Jeff that carries the water week in, week out. He's in not just Memphis. He's in every spot show we run. He's seven days a week. He's going to be here the next week and the next week and the next week and the next week and the next week. So how do we, in a lot of ways, protect Jeff on this card where the fans don't go? Oh man, that damn Jeff. We tried for 12 weeks to support his ass and he didn't get the job done. Bring idol in all oh, that got the job done. So there's a little psychology Conrad, if that makes sense, how do you predict? the, the weekly baby face in, in it week in week out. Okay. You just create the story where he goes one-on-one -on -one with the manager who's been a thorn in his side. So Jeff's vision and direction and, and mindset is Richard Lee. I'm going to finish you once and for all Monday night. And, and you just let idol and Lawler do their thing against the moon dogs. That was the psychology behind it. Make sense. Yep. Talk to me about the big black dog. He's going to debut in the moon dogs. Well, that's a real creative, uh, <laughs> that's a creative moniker. Um, God, what was his first name? Um, but he, he was, a um, a big old guy, man. But, um, I'll just say this. He also got a touch of moon dog itis. He, he wasn't a big fan of boards and trash cans and chairs and the such. So he wasn't in the territory long, but again, a role player, if you will, that it was really Jeff and the moon dogs and fuller was my partner and Lawler was my partner. Um, you know, idol came in as we referenced Tom, there was just different partners, but big block dog, like awesome Kong was an in and out, maybe a couple of week deal. Next up, uh, we've got, uh, the infamous angle with you and Lawler coming out in suits and the moon dogs attack you and strip you both of them. Uh, I'm sure your dad reimbursed you for the suits. Tell me about this. Oh, I, I mean, he, if I remember correctly, he probably gave me a gift certificate from, uh, what was it back then? Kane Sloan or Levy suits or something. I don't know, but no Conrad, uh, you, when I'm in this angle. Okay. Uh, let me look at one suit. That's probably got a tear in it or there you go. The oldest suit in the, um, in the closet. Let's do that one and go to, and get the cheapest white shirt. If you got to buy a new one that can be torn real easy. Cause you got to pre-cut it and all the little, we're giving away all kinds of trade secrets, but yeah, me and Lawler. And what about Lawler in a suit, which never happened. I mean, if that isn't an angle alert, Jerry Lawler in a suit on a Saturday morning. Yeah. Come on. Well, he has some of my money or something. Yeah. But anyway, episodic television. So you and all are come out to build another Monday night at the mid South Coliseum match against the moon dogs. And then February 10th, we see the moon dogs and the big, uh, black dog team up, uh, to beat you Lawler and Austin idol. The big black dog is going to pin Lawler. How is he to work with it, uh, again, Lawler loved his monsters. And again, uh, I don't know exactly where 
we're at in the notes and where this is going. But, you know, Lawler would, again, if you've got to do 52 weeks a year, Lawler can have a match with a broomstick. So bring big black dog, big black dog in. And again, Lawler got beat. When you hear that, oh, Lawler never got beat me. Oh, yes, he did a lot of times. But then that sets up a singles match for Lawler to go out, pull the strap down, and 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 beat a guy. And so that's the psychology of so Jeff and a partner will take on the Moon Dogs and Lawler against the Big Black Dog the following week. Again, getting as much mileage as you possibly can out of a program. Uh, let's talk about uh, where we go from here. Uh, the moon dog, this is directly from the observer, the moon dogs and versus Lawler and Jarrett matches have been the wildest and best brawls on major circuits in the country since the Eddie Gilbert cactus Jack matches. Since wow. it's so different from what is being done in the other promotion, it's quite refreshing to watch it. Although the quadruple juice just seems to be something that should be obsolete for health reasons. Now this comes to light because right before this, there's the whole magic Johnson moment. Mm. And that's, I think that happens in like November of 91 is when the world realizes what's going on with that. Here we are just a couple of months after that. And I got to ask, was that even discussed? You know, they're, they're saying at the time he can't play basketball. And as a rule, yeah. there's, there's not blood in most basketball games, but there's blood almost every time you're in there with the moon dogs. I remember the chatter, but also remember Oh boy. I don't want this word to come out. No, no, let me just, let me, I don't know where you're going, but let me just say this at the time. I remember I was at football practice at the time yep. and I remember it's what everyone was talking about, especially even the coaches. But at the time, again, this is 1991. We didn't know then what we know now. It was perceived as being something that was an ailment strictly for gay men. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But and, and, and so I'm just saying, we didn't know what we know about CTE or blood diseases back then, but I feel by and large, a lot of people saw this news and thought, well, that's not going to affect us because da, 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 but in reality, we know now, mm, maybe not the best thing, but I know there are practices. Like I don't use your blade and you don't use my blade and blah, blah, I, blah. So, so that you are about to go with is that again, boy, what if there's any science behind this, but the, 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 the sort of the running mentality, if you will, was, is that, um, you just didn't like oxygen once you, you, you didn't sit there and swap blood with each other. If that makes sense, it, 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 it what you had to be a little bit more careful, but it, it didn't prevent us or stop us from doing anything. God, wild, wild west. And it feels on the one hand, like it was five years ago, but on the other, it does feel 30 years ago. Oh my gosh. Feels like li a lifetime ago. What was so different about the moon dogs here? Meltzer is even going to low key credit the revitalization of this territory to the moon dogs. And really it's about the story. Is it all about the moon dogs or is it about what you did with them? Like, I don't think if you just slide them back in and they're feuding with anybody, it matters as much, but when it's Jeff Jarrett and Jerry Lawler and Austin idols here, well, man, they've got enough garnish around them. Yeah. Here's what I mean. Yeah. You know, I've had a recent conversation in my group chat about what the heck's going to happen with Cody Rhodes and some of my friends who aren't exactly big Cody fans, they say, oh, he's just going to be feuding with the Miz. He'll regret ever leaving as if to say he was working in world title matches when he left AEW. But the reality is he's going to fit somewhere, but I feel like what you're paired with is how people perceive you. So how do you make a top guy? You haven't beat other top guys. So, and, when he, and, and, and then how do you not make a top guy? You have him lose to guys who aren't top guys. And so it's all the booking, right? Well, so help me out here because I want to make sure that this is what I felt back then. This why I, I love doing this because the same thought processes are going through my brain right now. So to put it in context, 92 Hulkamania has, I don't call it dead, but it was really at a low point, but remember Hulkster and the expose and the steroid trial may be beginning, but it was 
what what WWF, WWF hell they actually even had a cartoon so the WWF was very cartoonish yeah. WCW uh, I don't know exactly what programming were, but they were the touring thing and it's showbiz and this isn't real and everything and it was so that may be the big time but that's also a bunch of phoniness but over here on Memphis TV on Saturday morning and the moon dogs come out and there's not any slicked up promos. And you see Richard Lee, who's a singer songwriter, but he's got a blazer that he wears the same one every Saturday morning. And he ain't, he, he, you know, Richard didn't pull up in a, uh, $150,000 car. He's probably driving a Ford LTD, you know, very relatable. And yeah. the moon dogs, Larry Smithson at his very core was the nicest biker dude that you ever met. Give you the shirt off his back. Great mechanic. Got there. Yeah, he just was salt of the earth kind of guy. Larry had a unique look. But anyway, so here's guys. I don't want to call them throwback, but Conrad, you watch us on Saturday morning and juxtapose that with what you saw on Challenge or Superstars or WCW Saturday night. That's the phony stuff. Oh, Jesus. Larry Latham just beat the shit out of that kid. That's a real board. That's a real trash can. That was real. And I don't want that to come out the wrong way, but why did it click? You could not watch what we were doing on the big time. You couldn't watch it on WWF and you couldn't watch it on WCW. Lawler was over. The moon dogs got over. I had been in the territory at this point, six years. So I had built the name myself. And so, Hey, these four men are, are going in there and they're kicking the shit out of each other. Okay, I'll buy it. I think that's why it clicked because we were late enough into the national expansion that they knew the difference. And oh, here's the territory. It's the small time. It, but it's that's our wrestling. And damn, they're kicking the shit out of each other. That's why I think it popped. Are you feeling the effects in your picture money, buddy? I, I just I, I would love to sort of drill down. But if there's one thing that enticed Robert Fuller to come back and make a few shots, he would tell me, Jeff, if I'm going to get my ass whooped later on tonight, we're going out there and we're doing some Polaroids and we're selling some pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, it, it, it was without question. People would come up and they would see the marks on us and, and whatever it may be. Yeah, it was it, it pulled it life. even further that this is real. Yes. So JYD winds up wanting some of that sweet, sweet picture money. He comes <laughs> in and works a six man with you and Lawler against the moon dogs and black dog. How was uh, JYD here? Do you, you tell me what, what do you think he, I think he, he got the sniffles of moon dog itis before he got on the plane to fly into Memphis, <laughs> but no, he was good. Look, Larry knew how to take care of guys that didn't necessarily. And so, you know, JYD would do his thing. But, man, that's the first time. Now, look, JYD, uh, Sylvester Ritter had worked for Nick Goulas, and he had done different things. But, you know, I had been in awe of the Michael Hayes, JYD, Bill Watts, just how much money. And I'd heard Bill Dundee talk about him and, Terry Taylor and anybody from the Watts territory. And then, you know, you look at the late eighties and uh, Hulkamania was running wild to me. There was a time period when JYD was the number two baby face. I thought there was Hulk and J I mean, he was really over. And so, you know, him coming back into Memphis, it was cool to have him in and look, it's him cutting a promo and he's the JYD dog against the moon dogs. It was money. So next up, you're going to go ahead and uh, break the black dog's leg and run him off. According to the observer, you actually wind up getting hurt with a legit back injury in March. Apparently the injury took place in a gym and not in the ring. What do you remember about this? So uh, again, th this is something that God almighty Conrad doing the research. And it's funny how Dave would have never gotten this information, but I had a crazy match in Nashville uh saturday nights and uh, i don't know if we were off on sunday um but anyhow conrad i got home and i can remember gosh this is 92 i'd love to google with your google machine as i'm telling the story google cast of saturday night live in 1992 
Uh, but uh, watch the matches. I mean, work the matches at the fairgrounds, had a wild moon dog uh, brawl and all this kind of stuff. And I got home and that was kind of my ritual. I would get home and I'd Saturday night live watch it. And I laid down on the couch and Conrad, as the show progressed, my stomach just was like, what the hell's going on? It's like knotting up and I hadn't eaten anything. And then it's like, I had back pain and then stomach pain and then back pain. And I'm like, and then I was bent double. And then I tried to get off the couch and I, I couldn't get up without excruciating pain. So, uh, at the time she was my girlfriend. Uh, I said, Jill, we got to go to the doctor. And, um, I, my dad, he thinks this funny story to this day. So we get up there and the doctor and I'm telling him all this kind of stuff. And he goes, Hey, thing, what we need to do is get you some cat scans. We got to take a look. I'm just going to scan you head to toe because your symptoms are kind of odd. And this, this, this isn't so, something's not right. So Conrad, get the, uh, cat scan and doctor and I'm laying on the gurney. And by this time, uh, I think they were like, we want to hold off to the cat scan comes back before we give you too much pain. Cause we want you to be able to tell us and blah, blah. I'm like, I'm dying. So the emergency room doctor comes in there and he said, Mr. Jarrett, he said, uh, got a couple of questions to ask you. And I'm like, yes, sir. And he goes, well, your abdominal pain is kind of a weird situation that we, we don't want to give you too much. We, we, we kind of think you're just going to pass it. And I said, pass it. And he goes, your intestines have been twisted and we don't know really why, but you have some serious, serious air locked up in your intestines and pain. And so, and I'm like, I got gas. <laughs> I got, you know, like he said, no, he said, you, you, your intestines are twisted and you got some food. He said, it's going to just, he said, I just think if you lay on your back, let you, anyway, that's going to pass. I'm like, oh my God. Anyway, he says, but that's not really what we want to talk about. And I'm like, what? He goes, we want to know what happened to your head. And I go, what? He goes, you have contusions all over the back of your head. And I go, yeah. He goes, no, what has happened? And I went, Oh, uh, those must be the boards. He literally could not figure out. Cause it, you know, I don't think it was a concussion, but it was, it showed up on a cat scan that I had contusions, bruises on my scalp from the boards that Larry, that we had done. And the doctor was like, well, your stomach's going to be okay. We're more worried about your head. And I said, Oh, that's fine. So my dad always says, is your, you know, what the doctor, What's your question about SNL 92? Who was the cast? Because anyway, it's no big deal. Dana, just, Dana Carvey, Chris Farley, Victoria Jackson, Mike Myers, Chris Neyland, uh, Chris Rock. You pointed that's the day, day, day. Because I just remember doing that era. I, I would never miss it. Oh, it was, it was great stuff. David Spade, Rob Schneider, Adam Sandler, Tim Meadows, on and on and on. On Saturday Night yeah, you Yeah, th but that was, I, I never missed an episode of Saturday Night Live during that era because we'd, wor we'd work my hometown, Nashville, and I'd get to drive home, and I'd get home right as it came on. Coco beware winds up taking your place while you're injured and uh, all the enhancement talent that the moon dogs have been beating up are coming back as lumberjacks and your return match on March 23rd in Memphis is going to be you teaming with Lawler. Nice idea to not just have random lumberjacks, but all the guys, the moon dogs beat up. They uh, all end up getting beat up by the moon dogs anyway, but you can, of course. You guys get the win by DQ and you're back on the road at, after that in Louisville and Jonesboro doing cage matches. How did it feel to be back? You getting back in the swing of things? Yeah. Yeah. Cause that was a short time deal and my low back had been bothering me some, but not like it was later, but th that whole moon dog program might've been the beginning of no, the car wrecks. What did it me and Eddie, that that's, that's really what set me, uh, down the road of, 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 of my back situation. But, uh, the moon dog stuff was certainly didn't help it. It headed it down that direction, but that's fine. We got back rolling. In Memphis on April 6th, you lose to the Moon Dogs in a tag title match, but then you throw them out in a tag team battle royal. Eric Embry becomes a player in the feud when the Moon Dogs beat him up, and your former Super Clash opponent is going to turn babyface. But you and Lawler don't really trust him. So Eric Embry saves you and Jerry from the Moon Dogs by throwing powder in their faces. You and Lawler agree to team with Embry, but make him sign a deal that if he turns on you, he'd have to leave the USWA for one year. 
So April 13th in Memphis, you draw 1400 fans, 8,000 bucks. And Meltzer has this to say, Jerry Lawler and Eric Embry and Jeff Jarrett beat Moondog Spike and Cujo and Richard Lee. After the match, Moondog Spot, who was doing an injury gimmick with a patch on his eye, I guess from fire, brought in a bubbling deal, which was supposedly battery acid to throw at Jarrett. Things are getting pretty heavy here, aren't they? But Embry jumped in the way to protect Jarrett and took the acid in the face and eyes and is now injured. They did a great job of grabbing drinks from fans to flush his eyes out, et cetera, and make it look realistic in the building. Such a great angle. And the selling here is phenomenal. Again, you can watch some of these clips over at myworldmoondogs.com. Tell me about this. If I remember correctly, Eric was heading out of the territory and it was a way for him to go. Uh, I may be wrong on that, but, um, again, we, you just sort of touched on Cujo Lanny Lanny was cousin junior of the WWF fame of hillbilly Jim and uncle Elmer and cousin junior, but Lanny as Cujo, the moon dog, he brought a whole nother of athleticism that, you know, uh, better than lesser than different Lanny athletic ability made him the best worker out of the entire run of all moon dogs. He just could work his ass off and look the part and God almighty, he'd whack the hell out of you. <laughs> I mean, big, big old guy. I mean, but anyway, good worker, uh, drew money with him. So let's, uh, let's talk about and, and the angle was good too. the, the acid and yeah, and that's phenomenal. Sold. Great yeah, stuff. And how it sold and Eric knew how to old school baby face sell. It worked. Um, black dog returns, turns baby face and saves you. Charlie Trapper is going to come in and start teaming with you. What can you tell our listeners about Charlie Trapper? I don't, I don't remember. He wasn't around for long. Um, he was just an old, just as his name. Old, old, old. I think he was billed from West Virginia or the mountains of Virginia or East Tennessee or something like that. Uh, journeyman dude that, um, you know, he, he probably didn't have a five-star match in him, but he, he, he was a character, uh, performer that just fit the vibe and the mode of this story. Uh, the moon dogs are going to wind up destroying an enhancement talent using the name trade Keller. I'm sure that has nothing to do with Wade, right? Weird. So weird. I, 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 no, but I mean, I don't remember that. That's I, I don't say it's weird. I, <sighs> I mean, once upon a time, we saw an enhancement talent for Herb Abrams, uh, get destroyed named Davey Meltzer. No way. Oh yeah. So I'm just wondering if Lawler named him trade or, you it know, what I'm saying? Lawler, because your dad was on the phone with him every week, telling him what you needed to do this early. I don't know. I'm just being a smart. I, no, I know. No, it's fun. No, but I, I know. I mean, it's, it's, I don't remember that either at all. In May, the observer would write this Lawler and Jarrett versus the moon dogs may be thus far the feud of the year. If only because with the exception of steamboat and rude, can you come up with another feud in wrestling? That's had a personal issue and consistently top notch matches. The feud seems to be somewhat running its course since how many more weeks can they keep doing the same thing? But this is the rare feud that not only drives business, but the quote unquote smart marks enjoy it as well. Uh, did you think by June it had run its course? Were you tired of working the Moondogs? We knew that. I mean, when you sort of look at the menu of it started with me and Robert and me and Lawler, and then like you know, we've we've already gone over it, Idol, and then bring a Charlie Trapper or a big black dog and just added a new moon dog. I mean, we had run the gamut multiple times and Eric Embry involved. And again, yes, we knew it was coming to an end, but when you take a step back and, and just kind of look at this might've been the last long range, long-term feud that made money. Um, but it's kind of the art of that weekly episodic. Don't get in a hurry, tell the story and make the people keep it, make, keep the people engaged, but let give them the ability to breathe and understand it. Next up, Eric Emery is magically healed from the battery acid. He's back to doing six mans with you and Lawler on May the 18th. It's hinted that if the moon dogs lose to you, Lawler and Embry, they're going to leave the territory. 
and you get the win, but the moon dogs don't leave. Why would you do something like a bait and switch like that? Do you think? I don't know. I read that in the notes. I, I just wonder if, I don't know if, if we're missing something where Eddie Marlin didn't come out on TV and some say some kind of contract or they got to finish out his bookings, you know, like one of those deals, he, he's got 30 days to finish out all of his legal obligations. And then he's leaving. I don't know. Global gets involved in the USWA with Burt Prentice leading the charge. And now we've got, I guess, a promotion versus promotion type war. The moon dogs are a part of that angle. And since they're heels, of course, they're used in that way. Pez Watley comes in and teams with you and matches against the moon dogs. Love me some Pez. What can you tell us about him? See, and this was on the tail end of the program and global getting involved. And so that's Petacino and, and the, uh, the other gentleman, uh, Ole or whatever. Anyway, it, all of this had, it gets fuzzy. I don't have the best recollection, which kind of tells me that the, the box office was out of this story and we were in a transition on what's next. But until we come up with something new, we got to sort of peter this out, finish it out. Moondog Spike even leaves the USWA in late June, but he returns in early July. Uh, and Meltzer would have this at the end of June before a moon dog squash Marlin said, if the dogs used the chair, they'd be banned from television forever. Of course, the first thing they did, you got it. They used the chair. Announcer Dave Brown came away from the desk and told Richard Lee that the moon dogs were suspended. Lee tried to hit Brown with a chair, but color commentator, Corey Macklin took the bullet and got hit with a chair. Moon dogs and Lee beat up Macklin until Jarrett and Billy Travis came out and got into the brawl. Of course, Travis chooses Travis gave spot. One of the hardest guitar shots ever. And Jarrett ripped Lee's pants off. The spot had a gigantic forehead cut from the guitar shot. And boy, this guitar shot was brutal. Do you remember this? Certainly wasn't a prop one, <laughs> but again, this is on the tail end. And now Billy's back in the territory, which I think he returned from Texas. I would have to we'd have to do some research to jar my memory of the moving parts, because as you could, we referenced global getting involved and now Billy's back from Texas. Cause he stayed out there on the literally the dying, dying, dying days, but now he's back and we'd had the moon dog run. So, um, it had, again, the program respectfully was kind of circling the drain and, and it, it appears that we went and said, all right, let's give it another shot and do the guitar and Larry, Juiced big time on TV. Um, the moon dogs finally dropped the USWA tag team titles in a cage match on June 29th, the Lawler and Jira in a match with Jackie Fargo as the referee Fargo's appearance is going to boost the gate to $9,500, about 1800 fans here. Largest gate of the year. Certainly the biggest in a while. The finish would see Cujo hold Jarrett and spot came with the bone. Jarrett moved and Cujo got hit with the bone. Jarrett pinned him biggest payoff with the biggest gate. What do you remember about this night? Got to be a highlight for you early in your career. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm six years into my career and, and getting Fargo in 92, you know, just, he, he just look, he was running his business operations. Uh, he, he was done, but however, it would be funny. You know, my, my dad would con, or talk or Lawler would con or talk, uh, Fargo, come on back one more time. Fargo would come and he loved hanging out in the dressing room and he would get young guys, you know, Jackie would all Jackie's one of the best rivers in the world. And he would, as soon as a new guy would walk in the room, he'd start like he's arguing with my dad and say, Jerry, I just, I don't know why you asked me to do this. I don't want to do this. And then he'd sucker the guy say, Hey, whatever it is, uh, trade or whatever. Come here. Will you talk to Jerry Jarrett? And this guy's just standing there and he's like, will you tell Jerry Jarrett? I don't need this $2,000 this bad. I don't want the, now this guy's getting paid $50 for the night and Fargo's whole rib is, will you tell Jerry Jarrett, I don't need $2,000 tonight or $3,000 or 5,000. And the guy would sit there and fumble and say, well, Mr. Fargo, I don't care. Tell him I don't need this cash. I don't, and he'd pull out a big wad of money. Anyway, Fargo had a lot of fun in those days. And I can assure you he wasn't taking no boards or chairs or but Fargo would swing it and cut the hell of a promo and we drew money. 
I think this is the last go around of the increase in houses. I think this is it because it petered off there for a while at the end of the Ambry deal, but Fargo, I think this is the blow off the blow off with Fargo. So, um, the follow-up is for Lee to put his hair up for another title match. Finally, Lee agrees. Smoondog Spike then no shows as he was scheduled to be there. And, uh, I guess he supposedly leaves USWA again. When did you find out that, that he wasn't going to be there? I, Bill was done. He, you know, he had, we had worked six months and, and Bill owned his own, um, business in Nashville. And, you know, it's one thing to go out on the road and have people run the shop for a month or a couple of weeks, but now we're into month six or month seven and Bill was cranky and tired and done with it and tired of me beating his ass with, with, with deal. And he was tired of beating us up. So Bill, great dude, but he, he, he was ready to, uh, as he would say, I'm going back to the shop, that kind of, that kind of conversation. Let's run in through, uh, what's next, because believe it or not, there's still some bigger gates. I know as far as in your mind, that's when it was really over, but there's still some, some big gates to come still Jackie Fargo is going to end up teaming with you and Lawler to take on the moon dogs and Richard Lee. Uh, of course, if you're not familiar with Jackie Fargo, man, you got to look up some info sometime. He was the is man. This, uh, is there video clips of this too? I'm not, I mean, I'm sure there is somewhere. I, I didn't know if it's in the, the, my world moon dogs. No, if you're, no, as far as I know, it's not my, it might be, I don't know what all they've been able to put together for us, but I haven't seen it. Okay. Moon dogs get the title back on July 6th in Memphis. They threw a blue liquid in your eyes and pin you. Uh, you're working with Cujo here instead of spike, but on July 13th, this was put together. Next up was Dave Brown talking about a tag title match signed for July 20th with the moon dogs. Once again, taking on Lawler and Jarrett. The stipulation is one of them would have to put up his hair to get the match and neither wanted to do so. So they decided to flip a coin and Jarrett lost. So if they lose Jarrett gets his head shaved, this is a, an old school step, but boy, this was, this was as Memphis as it gets. And, and you regain the titles, you hit Cujo with a low blow, uh, and you're going for a sunset flip and Cujo grabs the ropes, but Frank Morrell, the referee kicks his hands. You get the win. What was your favorite match of the whole series here? I was just sitting there thinking, so we're in, so we started working with them in two, uh, 1991, me and Robert did. So we're in July. So we're talking 28 consecutive weeks, no breaks, 28 consecutive The same thing weeks. over and over and over and over and over and over again. And we're still not done by the way. It's scheduled at the time. It's a rematch this time with Lee's hair at stake and Robert Fuller, who's returned. Now he's going to be handcuffed to Lee. Wow. That show does 2,500 paid and a $14,000 house. The biggest so far summertime, summertime. It popped. Wow. You keep the title. Lee gets his head shaved. And it's around this time that your father and Vince McMahon come to an agreement to start working together. That's a topic for another time, but you trade tag titles with the moon dogs a few more times in a couple of shows. And Moondog Fifi comes into play, which is Diane Von Hoffman. Yes. Oh, God. I forgot about Fifi. Oh, my gosh. That's right. I, when I was looking at research, I, yeah. She actually ends up getting her head shaved as well. That has to be pretty interesting. How do you convince a lady to get her head shaved here in 92? Real quick, dollars. There you go. <laughs> dollars. On August 24th in Memphis, what's billed as the final match ever between the Moondogs and you and Lawler? You guys win by DQ. And I guess it's about that time. It's August 24th. As a reminder, we started this in November of 91. So we've carried us now. Think about that. Yeah. 11 months. I mean, it feels like almost 11 months. We're rocking this 30 or 40 consecutive weeks. But I mean, yeah, it's episodic. Tell I've already, I sound repetitive, but episodic television, idol Lawler, Robert Fuller, Eric Embry. Big Black Dog, Awesome Kong, Charlie Trapper. All of these guys were in and out as my partners at some point. But Lawler, the mouthpiece, I mean, the, the great interviewer. And Robert Fuller's a hell of a talker. <clears throat> That's the thing that Larry Latham never said one word. And Cujo, all they did was bark, kind of like a bruiser Brody. Hoosh, I, I don't do a good impersonation. We need Bruce for that. But Richard Lee, 
a really good promo. He's not a Paul Heyman. He, he's not an Austin Idol. But when you think, look at the talkers, Lawler, Idol, Robert Fuller. Damn, dude, that's some episodic. And again, what we gave them, it was easy to suspend disbelief. I think that's another lesson. You know, in the line this week, and I was sign, uh, signing a lot of guys, Conrad would um, compliment your uh, your ability to to the bills, you know, the deep dive on business analogies and the story behind the story and all that kind of stuff. I think this uh, sort of uh, the uniqueness of this storyline in an era of '92, and you said Flair and Savage and whoever else, Sting and all, you know, everybody was on the quote unquote big time on TBS and on USA network. And here we are in this territory and the hardcore fans, the Dave Meltzer audience enjoyed this and bought into it. It's a, uh, I think there's a lesson and modern lesson to be learned. Uh, 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 I think there is a lesson to be learned in modern times. I, I really do. As, as we go down this walk toward history lane, I think there's a lesson to be learned that there's an art to episodic story. You just can't get too fast. The moon dogs are here just a few more weeks. I guess their total run here was about 11 months. You guys are in it for, I don't know, nine and a half or 10 or whatever it is. But, um, were you surprised when it won feud of the year? I, I, well, I'm telling myself, I don't even recall that when the awards came out that we won it, I think it was at least several months, if not a year. So I don't remember the moment when I, they said, Hey, you won feud of the year. It's just, that wasn't, you know, it was, um, again, the metric, the, the, the bottom line that I was, my mentality was what mattered was the box office. Boats don't cash groceries. Don't you can't buy groceries with, with, with votes, whether it was pro I'm not knocking Dave, whether it's pro wrestling illustrated or the observer you, you, that that's, you can't take that to the bank. Well, one of the things I'm sure you were hoping to take to the bank, you and Lawler, it feels like after you guys have been a tag team forever and ever, eventually the next natural twist would be, you know, you guys were together and now you're opposed to each other. Why do you think we never saw that on a bigger scale? Um, the most strictly business I made every town and I was a baby face and my dad's mentality was you, you got to sort of have that centerpiece baby face that the people know, know, like, and trust. I've heard a good buddy, you know, that, that, that literally was the mentality. So there was no sense. And me and Jerry working a feud in Memphis and maybe Louisville and maybe Nashville. What are we going to do uh, the other four nights a week to make money? Well, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Check it out. MyWorldMoonDogs.com. If you've never seen it, go watch some of it and let's celebrate some wrestling history today. Let's learn a little something. We're hoping to learn something next week here on my world. We're talking about TNA's destination X. We'll cover TNA's Monday night special without WWE airing raw, the creation of elevation X, Andre rising, appearing Bow Backlund running around TNA, allegedly <laughs> Raven's wife, creating some problems backstage, Mike awesome passing away. Samoa Joe taking on Christian Cage for the NWA title, Sting and Abyss in a last rights match, the Heartbreakers debut, plus the ghetto brawl, whatever that is, between Team 3D and LAX. I'm pumped for next week, but don't forget this week, go reserve your pay-per-view or pick up your tickets at supershowlive.com. Dallas is around the corner, April 1st. You don't want to miss it. This is going to be a highly talked about show and a, a much sought after collectible. It's the Jeff Hardy trading card. Did we cover everything today as thoroughly as we could? Are we done? Have we squeezed it all out of the moon docks today? I don't awfully do this, but because you know, the subject matter a lot of times because of the ad free family, but, and I'm excited about next week in a lot of ways, it's kind of the beginning of the, the, the real cool run of TNA 07, 08, uh, 09, whenever that, the, the, what destination X are we doing? Oh, seven. I don't know, man. I've been recording six hours. I'm done. So say whatever words you got to say, and I'm out of here. You're out of here, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Rocket cup is coming up. Uh, no, it was fun. Moon dogs. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I got granular, but, uh, no, it was great. I thought we had a great content for you. Man. A little different twist for you.
Uh, Destination X 07 is what we're talking about next yeah, week. Yeah, I thought because uh, yeah, a lot of fun. All right, get out of here, Conrad. You're you're. Uh, it's a crazy. Monday. I'm supposed to be at the mortgage office. I got to go. Come see me at buywithconrad.com or savewithconrad.com. You can always find more of me than you need at adfreeshows.com. Until next week, we'll see you right here each and every Tuesday on My World. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice any time we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.